only one network that makes it all possible. C-SPAN, brought to you as a public service by America's cable television companies, providing unbiased coverage of public affairs events from the nation's capital and around the world. Good day from Washington, D.C. You're watching C-SPAN. It's just about noon here in the nation's capital, and we're standing by to take you to the Rayburn House Office Building up on Capitol Hill for live C-SPAN coverage of a hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. The subcommittee, chaired by eight-term Democratic Congressman Edward Markey of Massachusetts, is meeting today to investigate recent disclosures that the securities firm Salomon Brothers may have violated government securities trading regulations. Members are also expected to discuss the implications of just how the Salomon Brothers case may impact government securities market reform legislation. A number of witnesses are scheduled to testify during today's hearing, including Warren Buffett, chairman of Salomon Brothers, and Richard Breeden, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, along with representatives of the Federal Reserve Board, the Treasury Department, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. We now bring you our coverage of today's proceedings. Okay, thank you. it overindulge here.
Good afternoon. Today's uh, hearing is uh, uh, a very important one. And uh, for the purposes of our orderly um, proceeding on uh, today's hearing, I think it's very important for us to uh, conduct a little bit of uh, housekeeping. And uh, it is very important for us to keep the uh, aisles uh, clean and clear if we could. And so what I'd ask uh, on either side is if you could compress back a, a, a somewhat uh, uh, more towards the rear of the, um, of the hearing room, each of you uh, who are standing in the aisles, you would uh, very much help us to uh, comply with uh, some of the uh, concerns which the other uh, people who are seated have with regard to their ability to uh, be able to witness uh, today's uh, proceedings. And uh, would thank uh, each of you, if uh, you could, in the aisles, uh, comply with that request throughout the course of the uh, hearing. Today's hearing is Congress's first public examination of the stunning revelations concerning illegal activity in the government securities market by senior officials of Solomon Brothers Incorporated. Clearly, all investors and taxpayers have a direct stake in the fairness of the most important financial market which we have, a $2.3 trillion market, one which provides the fuel for the nation's fiscal engine. This subcommittee's inquiry will not constrain itself to illuminating the darkness of Solomon Brothers' activities. We will be examining the following. First, not only what happened at Solomon Brothers, but why? Was there a corporate culture at work or a climate of permissiveness? Second, are these revelations reflective of more widespread unethical or illegal activities in this market? And third, how did regulators respond to what happened and what are they doing now? And finally, what can Congress do to prevent such activity from happening anywhere in the market in the future. This subcommittee began its own inquiry into the government securities market last September, when Representative Cooper and I wrote to the SEC Chairman Breeden requesting a comprehensive examination of problems in this market and the need for legislative reform. In May of this year, the subcommittee's first hearing on this issue focused on abusive sales practices in the secondary government securities market. In conjunction with that hearing, the subcommittee released a report from the Resolution Trust Corporation that identified at least 37 SNLs which lost a combined $620 million in the government securities market and whose ultimate failure and taxpayer bailout was directly linked to those losses. Finally, on June 3rd, I wrote to the SEC, the Treasury Department, and the Fed seeking a full investigation of allegations of manipulative activity in the primary market, leading to a squeeze in the secondary market. The Solomon revelations relate directly to the areas of inquiry in that letter. The admissions of wrongdoing at Solomon not only reveal an arrogant disdain for the law by former Solomon Brothers officials, but cut right to the heart of concerns about the adequacy of regulation in the market itself. We must be assured that all wrongdoers will be identified and punished, and more importantly, that there will be a true change in the culture of an institution which clearly went awry. With regard to the role of the federal government and the need for regulatory change, a broader reevaluation is in order. Unlike other securities markets, there is a very different oversight scheme that governs this market. And this scandal raises concerns over its value in serving the interests of taxpayers and investors. For example, can we continue to rely on an essentially private business relationship between the New York Fed and a limited number of privileged primary dealers with no set of codified rules. As for the enforcement of the laws, we rely on the SEC to be the cop, 
But compared with the SEC's vastly superior surveillance authority in other markets, in this area the SEC is a cop with no nightstick and no map of the streets on the beat. In my view, we need to consider a legislative agenda that directly attacks the weakest areas of regulatory oversight in this marketplace. First, the SEC and appropriate regulatory agencies should be given the authority to write sales practice rules to govern the relationship between broker-dealers and their customers in government securities. Second, the SEC should be given the authority to oversee the manner in which price and trading information gets to the public and regulators. Third, firms which participate in this market should be mandated to abide by standard internal procedures which act as the front line against illegalities. This would follow the model set in the Insider Trading Bill of 1988, which I authored along with Chairman Dingell and Representative Ronaldo. Fourth, consideration should be given to some form of large trader reporting for customers in this market in order to gauge better where major positions are in the market. Fifth, the SEC's general anti-fraud authority should be augmented to make explicit that any fraudulent or manipulative activity in the auction process is a violation of the securities laws. And finally, consideration should be given to formalizing the cooperation amongst the SEC, the Treasury, and the Fed over this marketplace. There is much work still to be done by the government agencies investigating the facts of the Solomon Brothers case and by those of us in Congress seeking both to prevent any such recurrence and to improve the fundamental fairness and integrity of this market. I expect that this hearing and the lessons of Solomon Brothers will set us squarely on the path of developing tough, common sense government securities market reform legislation. That concludes the opening statement of the chair. Now turn to recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you for holding today's hearing on what has been appropriately referred to as a Solomon Brothers case. To the public, this is probably a complicated issue involving arcane trading practices of one of Wall Street's most prestigious firms. But stripped of all of the language of Wall Street's bond traders, what the public, what my constituents, what the people of this country want to know is simply this. Are the American people, who ultimately are responsible for paying off these government securities, being ripped off by a few aggressive traders manipulating the market? In effect, was Solomon Brothers' chief bond trader trying to corner the market to squeeze out competitors to unfairly and illegally enrich the company and perhaps also determine in advance interest rates that affect other securities. And why didn't those at the top of Solomon Brothers report it as soon as they found it out? These are not easy questions to answer. And it's distressing that Solomon Brothers' chief officers withheld the information from the government for months before a government inquiry finally persuaded them to come forward with some of the facts. What else is missing from the puzzle? Before members of this subcommittee can determine how the regulations governing the government securities trading practices should be changed, we need to know the full story of who was at fault, how it happened, why it took so long to report, and if these practices were an isolated incident or if they are more widespread. For years, this subcommittee has been told that the industry polices itself, that more and more regulations inhibit the free market and are difficult and expensive to enforce. Well, I'd like to know whether or not this is a case of one bad apple in a barrel, or are there more? It's deeply troubling to me to learn that Solomon Brothers, one of Wall Street's most respected names, had on several occasions violated the Treasury's rules on bidding and apparently created several short squeezes. These actions are unconscionable, and this Congress and the American public will not tolerate a repetition of this reprehensible and arrogant behavior. 
That's one reason why I'm pleased that the Securities and Exchange Commission is broadening its probe to look into bidding practices of both commercial and investment banks. The SEC is attempting to determine whether there is widespread collusion occurring in connection with Treasury securities auctions. And if these allegations are true, our nation's economy has been harmed. Confidence in our capital markets has been eroded. And manipulative activities that undermine the confidence of investors ultimately will drive borrowing costs upward at the expense of the taxpayer. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is an excellent opportunity to begin assessing the status of the Treasury securities markets. I'm not willing to assume at this early stage that the entire dealer community has been engaged in improper activities solely because the SEC is conducting a broad-based investigation. Moreover, I'm pleased to learn that Solomon Brothers has a new top management, which I understand is committed to operating squarely within the law. I know that Warren Buffett and his new team at Solomon Brothers already have instituted procedures to stop abuses, such as preventing unauthorized bidding on behalf of customers. I also believe that the new team at Solomon deserves credit for cooperating fully with federal law enforcement officials and has not stonewalled or denied responsibility for the actions of their predecessors. These are encouraging signs, but we need to take a careful and dispassionate look at what is going on in the nation's biggest securities market. Mr. Chairman, after five years of the Government Securities Act, we have an opportunity now to review this legislation carefully to determine how the market has changed and how our laws should be strengthened to address any newly discovered improper activities. In my opinion, we should alter the Government Securities Act so that it fulfills the goals that I articulated in 1986 of protecting the citizens of this country while avoiding a regulatory scheme that is excessively burdensome and expensive. I want to welcome Mr. Buffett and today's panel of witnesses and look forward to their testimony and yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. I thank the chair and I congratulate uh, our chairman uh, for holding these timely hearings. We have a great deal to do uh, before October 1st when the when the legislation governing these markets uh, comes up for renewal. So it's a very timely hearing, and I congratulate Mr. Markey. Uh, government and uh, all of us have traditionally been loath to burden uh, the government bond market with regulations, particularly uh, regulations that really don't seem to be urgent and necessary. After all, this market is supposed to have been the safest, most efficient financial market in the world. And it's a safe haven. And it has been, and we want to keep it that way. Now, the efficacy of this hands-off approach is being questioned improperly. Is this, matter, uh, is this a matter of corporate greed? Is this a matter of uh, obsessive determination to win the game? Is this simply an aberrational uh, occasion that we've run up to? Or is it a corporate environment, a corporate uh, a community failing that has uh, produced these actions? And they're not alone. Looking broadly across the uh, spectrum of corporate markets, we've seen the Ivan Bosky affair, we've seen the uh, Michael Milliken affair, we've seen uh, the Keating affair, and now we see this. Now, most of the people in this room are professionals. Uh, and they understand that uh, the SNL scandal isn't exactly the same as the, as the uh, security scandals and the, and the, uh, uh, that we've seen with uh, Mr. Milliken and Mr. Boskin. And they are, in turn, different from uh, this serious problem. But to the public out there, I think uh, that is not quite so sophisticated. They're all. Uh, it's a mishmash, and I think John Q. Public may be feeling, and we hope he isn't, 
that there's something rotten in Denmark at the highest echelons of our financial community and that the leadership somehow or other is flawed. And it's up to us to find out why uh, these things have been happening. Uh, what is there about our corporate financial culture that produces these embarrassing, uh, disgraceful episodes? After all, the uh, the viability of our financial markets uh, uh, is a matter of global concern. We have central bankers from, a from Asia, Japan, uh, uh, Europe, who are uh, major su supporters of our system for, for financing America, so to speak. Uh, we have a $3.7 billion national debt. Excuse me. A $3.7 trillion national debt. Mr. Buffett was <laughs> nodding in, with some concern. $3.7 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, and I think we have to know what the impact is going to be on uh, consumer confidence on the part of bankers, investors, central bankers around the world. How much is this kind of thing likely to afford us, to, to cost us? Uh, if it's only one one-hundredth of one percent, you're talking about $370 million. Do I have the decimal point right, Mr. Buffett? Uh, if it's one-tenth of one percent, then you're talking about $3 billion, $370 million. If by any chance the cost of the consumer dismay and concern about the state of the market was 1%, and I don't for a moment think it will be, then you're talking about $33,700,000,000. Cost to our economy of, of financing America, including support of the uh, national debt. Uh, these are the questions we have to determine, the degree of, of investor uh, disquietude. Uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Slattery. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, would like to um, commend you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing in such a timely fashion. And I would like to welcome my fellow Midwesterner, Mr. Buffett, and my colleague from, uh, from Omaha, Mr. Hoagland, also to the committee. It's good to see you all. Uh, as I sit here today, I can't help but think, uh, Mr. Buffett, that you have an opportunity to uh, provide a great service for the taxpayers of this country, for thousands of shareholders of Solomon Brothers, for hundreds of thousands of investors around the world, and for some 8,000 employees of Solomon Brothers around the world also. Needless to say, it's a daunting responsibility and task that lies before you. And as you begin your service, I would uh, urge you to set uh, what you have described, I think, as a Solomon model for dealing with corporate incompetence and uh, corporate greed, but more important, gross negligence on the part of corporate management at the highest levels and blatant violation of a corporate manager's fiduciary obligations to the shareholders, and in this case, corporate criminality. And I'm pleased that, that you have moved quickly to fire the upper managers that uh, appear to be responsible for this activity and uh, responsible for this scandal. And I only hope that we won't learn in the future about any sweetheart deals with these managers that are being fired now, and I've expressed to you earlier my deep concern about even paying for their defense. And as far as I'm concerned, those responsible deserve absolutely nothing from Solomon Brothers, not a dime in severance pay, not a dime in any kind of remuneration of any kind, and not, not a dime to pay for their defense either. These are sophisticated, well-educated, highly compensated, probably very wealthy people that uh, have embarrassed Solomon Brothers, have discredited the securities markets in this country, and uh, 
they deserve absolutely nothing but a swift kick in the butt out of Solomon Brothers and onto the street. And I think I would speak for a lot of people in this country in suggesting what they would like to see from some of these people is them in striped suits sweeping the streets of Wall Street for a few months or a few years or a decade. And uh, uh, that would probably get the attention of others that are so inclined to, to engage in activity of this kind in the future. But uh, I hope that uh, the shareholders of Solomon Brothers will explore the possibility of perhaps a derivative suit or a shareholder suit to seek civil uh, uh, damages from those that have been responsible for, the, for this scandal. Um, what I would like to see this hearing focus on, and I think the task of this committee, is to hear from you, to hear from the Treasury, to hear from the Federal Reserve, to hear from the SEC about what can and should be done to prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future. And I specifically want to hear from the SEC as to whether they believe that they have adequate legal authority and adequate personnel to police the market today. Does the Treasury have adequate legal authority in this area? Uh, does the Federal Reserve System have adequate legal authority? And these are the questions that I would like to get answered today. And if they don't, and if they don't have adequate personnel to do the job of enforcing the law today, then why hasn't the chief law enforcement officer in this country, the President of the United States, been before the Congress asking for the authority and the resources to get the job done? And once again, I think we see a situation where where we are obviously very disappointed, and the people of this country are very disappointed that this kind of activity has taken place. So, Mr. Buffett, you clearly have a, a great opportunity and a great responsibility, and uh, your past reputation would indicate that you're up for the task. And I wish you well as you, as you commence a difficult responsibility. I look forward to your testimony today. And again, I urge you in the strongest possible way to demonstrate a lot more justice than mercy in dealing with these people that you're dealing with uh, within Solomon Brothers. Gentlemen's Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Like uh, most of my colleagues, I have uh, just returned from the uh, county fair circuit all across my district. And as these stories were, were breaking, uh, breaking in northern Ohio, uh, at one of my town hall meetings at the Randolph Fair, uh, Portage County Fair, a gentleman farmer came up to me and uh, he said, uh, waving these clippings under my nose, he said, how'd this happen? Who's, who's minding the store? And I suspect uh, that uh, the look I gave him was the best answer that I, that I could, uh, could engender at the time, and that is, is that apparently no one. And the fact is, is that there's probably lots of blame for this to, uh, uh, to go around. I, I finger number one this uh, Reagan-esque regulatory regime that we've had for 11 years in this town, which basically uh, seemingly took its cue from that hit Cole Porter song, Anything Goes. And once the market, in which we are told that we must repose so much trust, figures out that anything goes, then everything does. And the only thing that's left are the things that are, that are nailed down. One of the fears that I have is that uh, uh, the market isn't responsive or the government just doesn't care. Corporate compensation in this anything goes type scheme has been simmering as an issue. We know that uh, greed is good drove some of the decisions and activities that, uh, that, that were taken here. But we've gone way beyond corporate compensation. Mr. Breeden, from whom we're going to hear in a little bit, has testified about reforms needed in this area. It's no longer compensation. It's become a feeding frenzy. I've seen hogs at the trough act with more manners than what the public has been exposed to in the past few weeks, once again, of revelations about what people will do in order, to, uh, in order to, to enrich themselves. 
the second piece that, uh, that, that troubles me as I look to try to figure out where we need to, to apportion uh, the blame is this cozy atmosphere that exists between a regulator seeming to be, to be dependent on a trader simply because that trader is doing us a service. Well, heavens, I just can't help but feel the same way like when I go to these stores and some of these clerks who wait on me think they're doing me a favor by selling me something and taking my money to boot. It doesn't make any sense uh, uh, at all. It's an Alice in Wonderland, uh, turned on its head type approach to government regulation that just, uh, just is amazing to me. This cozy, almost incestuous relationship between those who seek to protect the public and those who want to serve the public uh, uh, is, is amazing uh, uh, to me. Uh, I can't believe that we could come up with any less efficient way than we are doing it today. The last point that I want to make as I sit, sit around and, and try to look at, at how this matter gets, uh, uh, gets fixed is once again an, an unseemly parallel from the savings and loan industry. That scandal, which has had political and economic implications for, for, for this entire country, has once again at its core a philosophical change of direction for which the taxpayers are ultimately going to be responsible. And that is, is that the taxpayer has to bail out potentially any failures that occur here. Not likely to happen because of the stability of the marketplace, uh, but uh, it is a lesson that should not be, uh, not be lost upon us. This uh, trust us philosophy that has driven this town, that is rife in your industry, uh, and upon which this Congress and this committee particularly is going to be asked to, uh, to make more judgments uh, uh, is, uh, is beyond me. Oscar Wilde said uh, a long time ago that life imitates art. Gordon Gecko and Sherman McCoy are alive and well on Wall Street. Bonfire of the Vanities uh, moving from fiction to nonfiction. Greed is good, master of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how we legislate that. What we do do is we encourage more people like Mr. Buffett to get in there and, my colleague said, kick some butt and take some names. But until more of your colleagues, similarly situated, Mr. Buffett, uh, rise to this challenge, then the Gordon Geckos and the Sherman McCoys are going to be the masters of our universe. And that, sir, is a sad day for us all. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. I, I thank the uh, chairman for holding these important hearings. Uh, no less than the United States financial well-being is, is at stake. Clearly, uh, what is at stake it has, is dependent upon the integrity of our primary and secondary dealers. So this. I think it's particularly important that we have these hearings. Uh, when you look at the transgressions that have been committed, in many respects, it's financial treason. It, it can, in fact, imperil the, the, the well-being of our country. And it's only by Mr. Buffett's intervention are we able to avert uh, and to stop the hemorrhaging at one of the most respected uh, financial institutions in this country. There are clear lessons and what has occurred. You have a problem at a financial institution, reminiscent of what we saw in the savings and loan scandal. Related to the fallibility of human beings, the regulators find out, they act ex post facto after the deed, and either they improve the situation or make it worse. I would have to say thus far, the regulators have acted appropriately and have not made the situation worse. Because if, if in fact, what had occurred Salomon Brothers had been closed down. We might have been in here a few weeks earlier, Mr. Chairman, having an emergency hearing because of an overnight failure of a major institution in this country. Clearly, the too big to fail doctrine would have been tested at its extreme, and the reper repercussions to our economy would have been very, very severe. So fortunately, we've been able to keep a balance, and it's been judicious thus far. And there are lessons 
in what has occurred. Clearly, we need to tighten regulation, coordinate the oversight between the four government agencies involved here. Greater disclosure is needed with respect to Treasury instruments, particularly in the secondary market. Participants need to be fully informed. We need to stop any collusion in the primary market. But I think bottom line here is that we are, as the gentleman from Kansas said, trying to avert this from happening again, clearly by raising the stakes and uh, clearly making out the wrongdoing that has been done. We can avoid that. And again, uh, Mr. Buffett, I want to congratulate you for the leadership that you've brought to this uh, problem. I think it has been a, it has been a very, very important a day for uh, America economy when you stepped in and averted a greater catastrophe. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, now recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I commend you for holding this hearing. I believe that it is both important and timely. I think that it is extremely important that we look into the questions associated with the government securities market uh, while we at the same time analyze and try to review the form that any legislation to deal with the FDIC, the bank failures, and the failure of the bank fund to have adequate resources to meet the challenges that confront it. I'd like to welcome Mr. Warren Buffett to the committee this morning. Mr. Buffett, you're a man of uh, unquestioned integrity, and you hold respect because of the great decency with which you have conducted yourself over the years. It's a matter of some comfort to me that uh, you are going to be in charge of Solomon, and I feel that uh, you will be a great force for good not only there, but elsewhere in the government securities industry. Having said that, market integrity has been severely threatened by behavior which we have seen at Solomon. The committee began its concern over these questions a number of years ago. And it's useful to look back a little bit at history, because as George Santayana tells us, he who refuses to learn from history is doomed to repeat it. In 1986, this committee reported out legislation reforming to a degree the government securities market. When Treasury testified before us in 1985 with government securities firms failing, and hundreds of millions of dollars in losses to investors being undergone, Treasury said there are no problems in the marketplace and that no new regulation was needed. Interestingly enough, we hear the same testimony today from the Treasury Department. And the dealer community, working in concert with the Treasury, were very successful in limiting, in limiting the Government Securities Act to Treasury rule, might, rule writing authority in the area of financial responsibility. It is interesting to note that during those same times, the Treasury lobbied most vigorously and diligently against anti-manipulation rule writing authority being placed anywhere. And they have consistently shown a policy which is very much in keeping with that of the Reagan administration and of this administration of deregulation. Let the good times roll. Get government out of business. Pay no heed to what's going on. The market will take care of everything. But the question is, who then will take care of the public interest, the investors, and the interests of the government? The Treasury has consistently resisted efforts to have proper regulation of banks, savings and loans, and government securities. And time after time, they, in concert with FDIC, FSLIC, the Treasury, uh, rather the control of the Treasury, and the Fed have resisted efforts to address clear evidence of wrongdoing in the financial markets. We can look about and see savings and loans, banks, all of whom are turning out now to be vastly worse than anybody ever predicted or anybody ever thought. And this is as a result of direct failure of supervision by the government supervisory agencies. All we have to do is look. Some, some $750 billion in bad loans made around the world by banks in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, that, that fact alone is of significant concern. Huge loans made for mergers, leverage buyouts, and takeovers. 
loans which were made under conditions when prudent economists warn that those same loans probably not only could not be properly serviced by the borrowers, but that it was doubtful even in bad time that interests could be paid. The GAO and the Congressional Budget Office have suggested that the bank insurance fund is going to be insolvent by year end. Yet the Congress is being pressed during time of expanding evidence of wrongdoing to move more rapidly and more rapidly towards consideration of legislation not imposing new regulation upon banks, but rather on the contrary, expanding their opportunities to move into new areas where wrongdoing, incompetence, and rascality will thrive and prosper, and where again the public will be called upon to make whole the results of wrongdoing, incompetence, bungling by greedy, avaricious, and incompetent people. It is clear that we are going to have to address the overall question of the bank insurance fund and its solvency. We will meet our responsibilities of addressing the question of what form the new legislation should take in this area. But there are important questions. Should banks be permitted to expand into broad, broad other areas? For example, do we want the Bank of New England to move into first executive or vice versa? Or would we like them to move into Penn Central or into Lockheed or into some other major failing U.S. corporation? As I've said, we will carry out our responsibilities. It would be far better that we were to spend our time dealing with not only ferreting out what the wrongdoing is, but what should be done about it, and instilling into the administration a proper determination to see to it that the laws are properly carried out, the public interest is protected, that wrongdoers do not profit at the public expense, and that the markets upon which this nation places so much faith and so much of its treasure and its confidence should be protected against both incompetence, wrongdoing, and disregard of the rules of law. I think that this hearing today, Mr. Chairman, is going to be an important one. It is one which will give us some appreciations of matters which are important to us. I am hopeful that when the Treasury appears before us, uh, that they will be better prepared to give us proper answers to matters of concern that this committee has to discuss in a much more informed and intelligent way some of the questions that this committee has, rather than saying, we do not know where it is in the bill, or we think it's there, but we have not looked at the bill of late. Uh, indeed, uh, that is the kind of behavior which reflects small confidence uh, in and upon the Treasury. And it is something which I think should cause caution for the Congress and enable us to understand that perhaps we would be better served to look a little more carefully at this matter before we rush into some of the uh, grand accretions of power to agencies which have found themselves not able to carry out their activities in the area of banking, in the area of public finance, and elsewhere. And so I commend you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome you, Mr. Buffett. This is going to be, I know these are difficult times for you, and we look forward to the benefits of your wisdom as you testify before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Gentlemen's the time has expired and all time for opening statements by members of the uh, subcommittee has expired. We'll now turn to our first witness and that witness uh, is a distinguished one, Mr. Warren Buffett, the new chairman and chief executive officer of uh, Solomon Brothers. Uh, Mr. Buffett is perhaps the nation's most prominent investment guru who has followed the path of the straight, the true, and the fundamental uh, while building his successes. While those values may have seemed to have been out of fashion in the go-go 80s, I have a real sense that they're going to come back with a vengeance in the 1990s. And I hope that uh, you, sir, can help us today to help us to apply those values not only to the job you have in overhauling the Solomon Brothers uh, structure, but also as to how we should overhaul the regulatory structure over the entire government securities of marketplace. Uh, Mr. Buffett is joined at the witness table by our uh, colleague uh, from the state of Nebraska, uh, Peter Hoagland. Uh, Mr. Buffett is from Omaha. 
and uh, Mr. Hoagland is here as well to uh, give a brief introduction to Mr. Buffett. Welcome, Peter. Ch Ch Chairman Markey, uh, Congressman Ronaldo, and Chairman Dingell, and other members of the subcommittee, it's my pleasure today to introduce one of Nebraska's most illustrious and inspiring citizens, a man who is typical of the people that we grow and nurture in the Midwest and whose abilities we so often contribute to the rest of the country. Warren has been called up for a very special tour of duty to guide Solomon Brothers through a crucial time. Nebraskans and Kansans and others in the Midwest have always produced good citizens and leaders who could provide sound advice for New Yorkers. And I know that, and I know that Warren Buffett will not hesitate to speak his mind. You all know Warren's reputation. He is America's premier investment manager. His company, Berkshire Hathaway, is considered to be on the leading edge of efficient, honest, profitable business practices. He is known as the Sage of Omaha, and his investment savvy has been the talk of Wall Street and Washington for years. But Warren Buffett is a very unusual businessman. After all of his successes as CEO and chairman and the largest shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway, he continues to choose to live in a quiet, tree-lined neighborhood in Omaha, and he works in a modest midtown office building instead of moving to some financial center like New York City. Sound evidence, Warren, of your good judgment. And Warren is even more unusual, is an even more unusual CEO. He prepares and files his own tax returns and has done so every year of his life since he was 13, when the money he earned on multiple paper routes pushed him over the minimum amount for filing. I do not know of any boy in America who has filed tax returns based on cash proceeds from paper routes. I think that much of Warren's success can be traced to growing up in Omaha, a beginning that instilled in him the old-fashioned values of integrity, discipline, and character and Nebraska is full of people like him. Warren's friend Charlie Munger tells the story of a boy whose nickname when he was growing up in Omaha was Boob. As an adult, Boob moved to California and made a big fortune in a big hurry. But enough lessons from Nebraska for today. Warren is here because he has a responsibility of reforming Solomon Brothers for the future and protecting the well-being of the 8,000 employees and their families that have been thrust upon him. He is charged with restoring the public's badly shaken confidence in the integrity of the most important financial marketplace in the world. His honest, low-key style, his respect for the rules and the proper role of government, and his keen financial mind will provide Solomon and the financial community reassurance and leadership. There is no more capable or honest person in the country to assume this challenge. It's an important job at a critical time in our nation's history. The country simply will not benefit from the destruction of a company employing 8,000 people for the misdeeds of a few. Instead, those few need to be punished and the company reformed and set straight. Nebraska is being sent in to help Wall Street in this effort. And those of us in Omaha are very proud of the man that has been chosen for this job. Warren? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Buffett. Mr. Buffett, uh, whenever you feel comfortable, pull up to that microphone and uh, please begin. Mine. Is this that? It's working? Yes. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee. I would like to start by apologizing for the acts that have brought us here. The nation has a right to expect its rules and laws to be obeyed, and at Solomon, certain of these were broken. Almost all of Solomon's 8,000 employees regret this as deeply as I do, and I apologize on their behalf as well as mine. My job is to deal with both the past and the future. The past actions of Solomon are presently causing our 8,000 employees and their families to bear a stain. Virtually all of these employees are hardworking, able, and honest. I want to find out exactly what happened in the past so that this stain is borne by the guilty few and removed from the innocent. To help do this, I promise to you, Mr. Chairman, and to the American people, 
Solomon's wholehearted cooperation with all authorities. These authorities have the power of subpoena, the ability to immunize witnesses, and the power to prosecute for perjury. Our internal investigation has not had these tools. We welcome their use. As to the future, the submission of this subcommittee details actions that I believe will make Solomon the leader within the financial services industry in controls and compliance procedures. But in the end, a spirit about compliance is as important or more so than words about compliance. I want the right words and I want the full range of internal controls. But I also have asked every Solomon employee to be his or her own compliance officer. After they first obey all rules, I then want employees to ask themselves whether they are willing to have any contemplated act appear the next day on the front page of their local paper to be read by their spouses, children, and friends with the reporting done by an informed and critical reporter. If they follow this test, they need not fear my other message to them. Lose money for the firm and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I will be ruthless. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Buffett, very much. The chair will recognize himself for a uh, round of questions. Let me, let me begin by uh, asking you the obvious question. Is Mr. Mosier's uh, set of actions and the response of other executives uh, to his actions at Solomon Brothers something which is uh, sui generis to just those individuals? Or do you think it reflects a larger culture which was uh, allowed to be created during the 1980s, during the era of deregulation, uh, that uh, requires uh, closer attention by Congress uh, and by the firms uh, to ensure that there is a new set of procedures which are put on the books, both official from a governmental perspective uh, and internal from the institution's uh, perspective that ensures that uh, we let all individuals in that marketplace know that business as usual has finally ended in this marketplace. Mr. Chairman, I understand that you're asking the question about the entire industry, uh, is whether these fellows' actions were sui generis, basically. I, and I, Solomon yeah. as well. Well, and the I, culture I, that was created that yeah. made all of these activities possible. We have, we have been looking uh, through 45 auctions. We've, we've had teams of lawyers there. They have not had these powers that regulatory authorities have and which, which I welcome. Uh, we have not found uh, anything beyond what is in the submission, but uh, there, the, the, the place is going to be honeycombed with not only our own investigation but with others, and uh, uh, we will see where that leads. Uh, I know of nothing at, at Solomon uh, that uh, goes beyond what has been put into the submission. It's not over uh, in terms of us looking at, at, at the problem. In terms of whether it's sui generis uh, or whether uh, uh, there's a larger climate that exists in Wall Street, I, I would say to some extent it's in between. I don't think, I don't think that, uh, that uh, uh, the only uh, crimes that have occurred to, in Wall Street have occurred with uh, the people we're talking about in, in, in this submission. I also don't think it is rampant uh, th throughout Wall Street. I think that, uh, I think that huge markets attract people who measure themselves by money. And I think that, uh, I don't think that's the only type of people they attract, but I think that there, there is a special attraction of markets. Uh, and if someone goes through life and measures themselves uh, solely by uh, how much money they have or how much money they earned last year, sooner or later they're going to get in trouble, in my view. All right. Well, let me, let me then uh, follow up on your opening statement where you uh, commented that it's not only important to look to the past but also to the future. Right. And uh, ask for your help then in looking at the legislative uh, solutions that uh, might help to ensure that we not, never again see a repetition mm -hmm. of this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to do, sir, if I could, is to walk you down a set of issues and to get your uh, sense of whether or not uh, any of these uh, make sense. The first would be mandatory firm procedures. That is, that we mandate them legislatively. Uh, along the lines of the uh, mandatory firm proceeding uh, uh, protect, uh, 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 safeguards, which we mandated uh, 
to be built into the Insider Trading Act of 1988 in order to monitor those kinds of activities, uh, to require that all firms that deal in government securities internally build a formal system that ensures that that is the first line of defense. Uh, do you believe that that would be something that is an appropriate response from Mr. Congress? Mr. Chairman, I have no problem with that. I, I, I would hope that at Solomon we would go beyond anything that uh, the regulatory authorities come up with, but I, I, I have no problem with with tough rules, tough cops, and tough prosecution. Excellent. Uh, secondly, large trader customer reporting. Uh, in response to the uh, market crash in 1987, this committee uh, last year uh, passed a piece of legislation which gives to the appropriate regulators the ability to uh, have access to the large trades that go on out in the marketplace so that on an, on on an ongoing basis uh, they can have a snapshot of what's taking place uh, in that, those marketplaces. Uh, here, it seems to me, since many of the regulators fly blind without any actual knowledge as to what's taking place in this marketplace, um, we're considering uh, building in a large trader provision here as well so that they can have that information on an ongoing proprietary basis uh, so to have a sense of what's happening in that marketplace. Does that make any sense to you? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure exactly what information uh, the present regulators do obtain, but I, I, I see no problem with, uh, with uh, the appropriate authorities uh, having information about uh, uh, large positions. I think, for example, now that uh, unusual movements in stocks are, are, are monitored by both the New York Stock Exchange and the SEC, and I, there are things that go in and, uh, on in markets that should be watched. I have no problem with that. Okay, thank you. The next uh, point would be making the auction rules a direct violation of the securities laws uh, so that uh, those who might consider uh, engaging in uh, illicit activity in this area understand uh, that there are much more severe penalties under the securities laws uh, which they could invoke if, in fact, uh, they did uh, cross that line. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, I've never written a statute, so I'm not going to try and uh, uh, pick out exactly where, where it should be, but I have no trouble with there being very tough penalties administered by very tough people uh, with anybody that fools around with the auction process. And uh, let me, uh, in this area, just finally ask uh, uh, the question of whether or not there should be government authority over how price information is sent out to the public so that there can be some sense of integrity, uh, a greater sense of confidence which investors and the taxpayers can have uh, in the uh, information which is used in this marketplace. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, my impression is that uh, the price information, that, uh, at least as, to me as a purchaser, purchaser of Treasury securities, uh, uh, I, I feel that, that I probably obtain good price in, in information. I think that uh, uh, markets tend to be very close in that arena, and, and, and uh, uh, I, I think I can find out, even though I'm not a, never acted as a dealer or anything of the sort in, in that market, I. I've, I've bought treasuries for my own account. I bought them for the account of Berkshire Hathaway, and I, I, I think I get good price information. Now, there may be some gap that I don't know about, but, I, but in, in, uh, I, I'm not aware of a, a big gap on price information. Well, the, our problem is that, unfortunately, every investor is not Warren Buffett, <laughs> and every investor does not have the access to information which Warren yeah. Buffett has. And unfortunately, the government happens to be in that situation yeah. right now. Well, the, the government ways, should certainly have the information. On an ongoing basis, you seem to know more. Uh, than uh, many of the government no. regulators um, uh, the know. Go and so our, the government our, should have good price information. Our concept I have no here is that if we do it with stocks, we do it with uh, options, we're now going to do it with uh, penny stocks, why not do it here as well? Just mm -hmm. so that information is public and yeah. uh, basically uh, uh, certified by the government without in any way impeding upon uh, any uh, productive business activity. No. I have no problem with the government obtaining good price information. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, just let me ask you one uh, final uh, set of uh, inquiries, and that would be this. The, could you provide to the members of this committee uh, the following information in writing uh, by the close of business uh, on Tuesday, September 10th? A detailed accounting of the profit acquired by Solomon Brothers Incorporated resulting from transactions from the following four auctions, December 27, 1990, February 7, 1991,
February 21st, 1991, April 25th, 1991, and May 22nd, 1991. An accounting of any compensation that Mr. Mosier personally received in each of these transactions, a duplication of all corresponding documentation held by Solomon for these auctions, including all tender forms provided to the firm by the Federal Reserve, as well as a reconciliation of the estimated bids and actual bids. And finally, a review of the 45 auctions that Solomon has reviewed internally, including the total Solomon bid and award, the total customer bid and award, and the individual customer bid and awards. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Denham to comment on the feasibility of providing everything you've uh, asked for by September 10th. I mean, I simply, uh, I, I, going back to your first point about the profit, for example, on the on the uh, transactions, uh, that that sounds like a very easy proposition. But th there can be offsetting positions in terms of. Uh, of, of, of future transactions, there can be movements in the general market which would, which would cause any government security owned. We are in the process, as I understand it, we are in the process right now of working with the SEC to develop a model that will give us and them uh, the best information we can uh, about that uh, uh, question of just what money was made by by Mr. Mosier's uh, misdeeds and and. Uh, uh, and or what money was lost. I understand some money was lost, but I don't necessarily believe that until I see the model. Uh, you can understand, Mr. Buffett, from our perspective, right. this information is the key information which we need in order to develop motivations on the part of the individuals yeah. in the marketplace that then help us to accurately frame the legislation uh, to ensure that there are no repetitions. And Mr. Chairman, I, you, you, you've got you, my total cooperation. I just don't know in terms of September 10th. I, I don't want to make any promises to you I can't keep. And well, is Mr. Denham here? Yeah, Mr. Denham. Mr. Denham, it? could you uh, provide us the information to the best of your ability as available by uh, September 10th? We will provide all information to the best of our ability. The, uh, most of it, uh, most of the items... Can you move the microphone over? The, yeah. Uh, Mr. Dunham, please. Push that button forward. Mr. Chairman, we will provide the information you requested to the best of our ability by September 10th. Uh, most of the items uh, that you requested, uh, I believe, uh, we should be able to provide by then. Uh, as Mr. Buffett stated, the information about uh, the, the profits from each auction is a little more complex. We will submit that to you as well as we can and as quickly as we can. Uh, the information about compensation uh, as it relates to these auctions of Mr. Moser, that I think is not difficult and, and should be able to be presented quite quickly. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Buffett, very Thank much. You. My time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Buffett, did the Board of Directors of Solomon Brothers approve golden parachutes for Mr. Gutfren, Strauss, or Merriweather? No, sir, they did not. Thank you. Um, your testimony, the written testimony that you provided, says that senior management's delay in reporting the violations was inexplicable and inexcusable. Well, uh, I agree that it's inexcusable, but I think it can be explained don't you think, uh, as a member of the board at Solomon Brothers, that senior management might have noticed Mr. Mosier's activity sooner and taken action quicker if he had been losing money? Uh, I think they probably would have noticed uh, anybody's activities in the firm that was, if they were losing a lot of money. As, uh, uh, I, I, I can't argue with that. Uh, I would say this, uh, uh, Mr. Ronaldo. I, uh, I have described these activities as inexplicable and inexcusable. I hope before too long and with the aid of authorities who can immunize witnesses and, and subpoena people and prosecute for perjury, I hope that it uh, does not remain inexplicable indefinitely. It will always remain inexcusable. Thank you. I noticed on uh, page 24 of your written testimony the statement that Solomon purchased $10.6 billion out of the $11.3 billion of two-year notes offered in May of 1991. Your statement, however, did not include a calculation of the percentages. 
But the way I calculated, it appears to be almost 94% of the competitive, competitive bids and approximately 86% of the total auction. Now that one firm could obtain that high a percentage of a U.S. Treasury auction is mind-blowing and of course it created a short squeeze. Perhaps as shocking is the revelation on page 30 of your testimony that Mr. Mosier proceeded to loan out the market he had cornered at an interest rate which he set. Now apparently the finance desk at Solomon just followed his instructions. In the descriptions of the responsibilities of the fired or suspended officers of Solomon contained in your testimony, none appear to have been responsible for the finance desk. Didn't the finance desk officers have to know of the corner Solomon had? And are they being held accountable for participating in this manipulative scheme, or haven't you gotten to them yet? Bob, have we interviewed the um, finance uh, desk? Uh, Larry, can you give him any help on that? Uh, yes, yeah. Mr. Petowitz, who uh, uh, has uh, been leading the investigation uh, since July 8th. Uh, members of the finance desk were interviewed. Oh, you could switch that. Yeah. On your microphone, sir, and, and identify yourself in full uh, and the, uh, uh, the law firm or whatever other association you have. Yes, uh, my name is Lawrence Petowitz. Uh, I'm a partner at the law firm of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. Uh, yes, uh, members of the finance desk were interviewed, um, and uh, it is perfectly clear that um, they were aware of the fact that uh, they had the ability to um, set the collateral rate, but um, insofar as wrongdoing, it's entirely unclear whether um, they would have been aware of any impropriety uh, in the following sense. The rules as they presently exist. Excuse me a minute. You said it is unclear as to whether or not they were aware of any impropriety? Yes, correct. Uh, I should say uh, more accurately that uh, I have no evidence that they were aware of any impropriety in, in the following sense. The rules that currently exist permit one, a, a firm, to bid for 35 percent of the market and also permit customers as well to bid for 35 percent of the market. <clears throat> in this particular instance, um, this 10.6 billion, uh, which uh, was a very, very high percentage of that which was available, uh, was for the most part, putting aside the, uh, the so-called tiger bid, uh, legally obtained. That is, that the firm could control under present rules um, a very, very high percentage of the market and uh, then be free to uh, set the collateral market to the best of its ability. Okay, I think that explains that adequately. Uh, I want to continue with a few more questions. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Buffett, how active was the Solomon Brothers Board of Directors in managing the company? How and actively? The reason, the reason why I'm asking that question is that the board of directors, as I understand it, of a corporation such as Solomon Brothers, has a duty to oversee the officers of the company. Do you feel that perhaps the board should have been more active in overseeing the activities of the officers of the company, particularly the ones who were fired at your direction? Well, I would, I would say this, uh, uh, Mr. Ronaldo. The, the board uh, met perhaps eight times a year, something in that range, seven times. Uh, uh, the primary sources of information for a board come um, from external auditors. That's why there's an audit committee who, has, who talks to the board in the absence of the internal management. Uh, the internal auditors of the firm, uh, occasionally perhaps some anonymous letter or something of the sort comes in that might inform you, but overwhelmingly the directors do get their information from the management of the firm. And if the management of the firm is withholding information uh, until some event comes along, until the outside auditors pick up something which would not have been the case in this situation, uh, uh, it, 
they are going to uh, they're going to lag if their information source is no good. Now, I think the test is what they do when they do find out about uh, what has taken place. And uh, in this case, I would say that it was a Wednesday afternoon, uh, uh, the 14th, when uh, the outside directors by phone, we were all hooked up. Uh, a couple were in England, one was in Alaska, at, uh, and, and we at uh, 1 o'clock Midwestern time, 2 o'clock, I guess, New York time, found out uh, uh, the dimensions of, uh, of what had gone on. And uh, we scheduled a meeting for the following Monday morning. It turned out, because of subsequent events, we moved that up to Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. But uh, the board, when it found out, acted. Uh, it, it did not have any information, information about uh, these matters. Um, I really don't see how if the uh, four people were hiding it from the authorities that uh, uh, we were going to find out about it on the, at the board level. So the board had no inkling of this prior to the date that you mentioned. What I would like to know, and I think you're taking a very aggressive and appropriate stance in trying to clean up a sordid mess, but what do you see the role of the board being in the future? And by that I mean, will it play a more direct role in overseeing the operation of the firm? Will any procedures be put into effect so that the board, although it's a policy-making body, will be in a better position to determine prior to a, uh, an admission, in fact, that any illegal activity is being taken, pla taking place? Because there seemed to be a culture or attitude at Solomon by the officers that, were, that have since left that encouraged operating close to the line? Well, tomorrow there will be a board meeting, the first one since that meeting of uh, uh, the 18th. Uh, it was, was scheduled for today, we moved it. And one of our first actions will be to set up a compliance committee of the board headed by Lord Young. And uh, the chief compliance officers will report directly uh, to that committee. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether there is a compliance committee like this in existence in other publicly owned financial uh, companies in the United States, but there's going to be one at Solomon starting tomorrow. There's been a firm, uh, nationally recognized uh, auditing firm that uh, not associated with past audits that is coming in to recommend any controls or compliance procedures that they think make sense and believe me, we'll, we'll implement them. But the most, uh, I, I consider the most important thing to be on both ends of it. I, 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 that's why, I've, essentially, I'm the chief compliance officer. And I have, I've, uh, I sent a letter out the uh, first day, which, uh, first morning, which I've appended to uh, my submission. And uh, uh, all of the top people responsible for compliance and controls in Solomon have gotten my home phone number. And they're supposed to call me first and then immediately go through normal channels if anything happens. And then at the other end, I essentially have deputized every one of those 8,000 employees to behave in a way that can stand to be on the front page of the paper. And if, you know, in, in between, we're going to have all the controls and all of that, but it, it has to be at both ends of the, uh, uh, of, of the barrel also. The gentleman's time thank you, Mr. has well, thank you, Mr. Buffett. expired. Thank you. Uh, could I ask Mr. Buffett that uh, as part of that uh, September 10th correspondence with us that you also send along these new compliance procedures which you are going to uh, uh, consider it tomorrow, adopt hopefully we will do so. at the firm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let me add as well, parenthetically, that along with uh, Mr. Dingle and uh, Mr. Wyden, we are drafting a comprehensive uh, set of uh, auditing uh, reforms that will put uh, legal responsibility upon outside auditors uh, as part of our version of the banking reform bill uh, that will uh, ensure that we fill that hole that has been out there throughout the 1980s. And uh, just for the record, that is going to be a part of any package that emanates from the uh, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. And Mr. Dingle and I and Mr. Wyden have been working on that over the last several months. Gem gen uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Buffett, I applaud the early moves that you have made as Chairman of Solomon. Uh, it seems to me that adequate reporting and disclosure should be an absolute prerequisite for par uh, participation in the government securities market. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that that would be imposing onerous requirements on the industry. Would the required dissemination of such information of all kinds be a proper 
a requirement across the board in your industry. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shoyer, you know, I, 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 uh, I agree that the ability to be a primary dealer is a, is a privilege and that, uh, that uh, whatever the authorities think are the, 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 the materials they need in order to do their job, uh, they're going to get from us. I, I have no quarrel with that at all. But, uh, well, <clears throat> I, think, I, I think on top of that, we ought to even go beyond that in our own place, I uh, understand. But I, I, I just don't, uh, I don't think that you would want to reveal positions to the public that might tell what you thought was going to go up the next day or down the next day. But in terms of, in terms of uh, knowing where we stand, I mean, it, 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 I, think, I think the position that uh, Mr. Ronaldo described as mind-blowing, I think that that is a pretty good description. I would accept that characterization. And uh, there shouldn't be mind-blowing uh, positions that exist uh, uh, with government bond dealers. Right. Well, I don't think any of us want to overreact and impose onerous and expensive and difficult and time-consuming reporting requirements. But at least the minimum reporting, it seems to most of us, ought to be done. And it seems that a refusal to provide market information uh, by Salomon's partners in the government securities uh, industry uh, certainly invites burdensome regulation by this Congress. And what we have to do, it seems to me, is to fine tune what we require to what is necessary and appropriate. Uh, Mr. Shoy, I, I think, you know, eventually what we would want is we would want the government, the U.S. government, to borrow at the lowest possible cost, consistent with all other external factors, and we would want the least cost to be interposed by the market between the issue of the securities and who finally ends up buying them, and the, what I would call the frictional cost of distributing the securities. And if the government gets the lowest interest cost and the lowest distribution cost, I think that, I mean, that's the eventual goal. That's the name of the game, and that's what we need to protect yeah. the public and I think uh, so. investors of all kinds overseas and at home. I thank the chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Slattery. Uh, Mr. Buffett, I uh, share Chairman Dingell's concern about whether our regulatory agencies really have the capacity to monitor what is going on in our financial markets these days, whether we're talking about the regulation of derivative securities in the international marketplace or the kind of activity that, that we are learning about here today. And I'm just curious, from, from your experience um, in Omaha prior to assuming your present duties, and, uh, and based on what you've learned in the last month, do you believe that the SEC, for example, has the uh, resources to do the job that the public really is expecting it to do? Well, I would say this. I, I do think more of my experience has been in equity markets than, than in, in, in debt markets. And I, think the, I, I do think the United States has the best equity markets in the world. And I think that one of the reasons that we do uh, one of the major reasons, perhaps the major reason, but certainly one of the major reasons, is the fact that the SEC has, has behaved over the years as they have. They are recognized, I think, as being a, a tough cop. And I think that uh, uh, securities markets uh, uh, can use that. So I, uh, I can't tell you exactly. I, I don't know the budget of the SEC, and I don't know, uh, I don't know that much about uh, exactly even how it's distributed within it. But my guess is that... Uh, Whatever what's, the enforcement the division among, gets, they're earning their money. <laughs> yeah. What, what's the talk among the people out on the street? I mean, do they do they look at the SEC as a, a tough cop they have to deal with? Do they think of the SEC as as an agency that, that you can work around pretty easily? I mean, what's what's sort of the talk on the street I, about? I think the SEC is looked at, a, at as a, as a tough cop. I do not think they are looked at as a paper tiger at all. The SEC is it's been a long reputation. You build that reputation over decades, and I think that uh, people. Uh, in enforcement uh, in the SEC, I think there's a certain uh, maybe type of, uh, uh, and I mean this in the very best sense, but I, I think that there's a feeling they can attract uh, young people out of school who could probably earn a lot more money elsewhere and that there's a certain Marine Corps mentality about getting the job done and I think they've done a great job in that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Mr. Buffett, I'm changing subject here on you, but um, uh, how was Mr. Mosier compensated? Was he compensated with a salary and a commission, primarily commission, or do you know? Yeah, I, I do know. Uh, almost all of the top executives of Solomon, including uh, Mr. Mosier, were compensated by a uh, what they would have regarded anyway as a relatively small salary uh, and uh, uh, very large bonuses. Now the bonuses were not strictly not commissions at all. I, I don't believe there's anyone at Solomon mm -hmm. that's paid on a commission basis, including salespeople. But certainly, it was a reflection in a significant way, not exclusively, but a significant way of the profitability of the areas under their control. So it, uh, it, it was not a commission on any specific transaction or the month or anything of the sort. But they would get at, big bonuses at, at the, the end, end of, of the year. year they got a bonus. And, and, and the better the year they had, the bigger the bonus they expected. Mm -hmm. um, I would like for you, if you could, to, um, and I know in your written testimony you've provided some detail on this, but I'd like for the oral record to show uh, a, a discussion and an explanation from your standpoint about really, really what happened. I mean, there's some very serious charges that are being, being made here, charges about price fixing, uh, the sale of, of billions of dollars worth of securities. This is, this is a very, very serious charge, and I'm just curious, did it happen? Why did it happen? Well, Tell us in, what, in what, layman's what language it, what you think happened. Yeah, what we put in the submission, I believe, happened. I mean, it, 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 and, um, it's hard to characterize it entirely, but it, 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 it and I, once I've said something is inexplicable, I guess I shouldn't try and explain it, but I will. The, uh, uh, in the middle of 1990, in July of 1990, Mr. Mosier, I believe it was July, put in a bid with the U.S. Treasury for an issue that they were handling for the, I believe, the Resolution Funding Corp, where he bid for more than 100 percent of the issue. and. I believe at the time there was no law against bidding for more than 100 percent of the issue. You, Tell you, us you could, how he did that. I think, uh, to my knowledge, uh, you fill out a form and, and, uh, and uh, if the issue is 10 billion and you bid for 11 billion, at that time there was no rule against that. There was a rule that you could not obtain more than 35 percent of the issue so that uh, the proration factor would be applied against this larger bid. and. Uh, if you thought the issue would be heavily prorated down, you might bid for more than 100 percent, knowing that the 35 percent would be the maximum. The Treasury, as I understand it, found that bid so outrageous, uh, and I have some sympathy for their feelings, they, that they rejected the bid entirely and then put in new regulations that said you could not bid for more than 35 percent of, uh, of, uh, of the issue, uh, as well as not obtain more than 35 percent. Mr. Mosier was a critic of that rule. And in effect, I think, in some way, felt that, uh, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing at behavior, but that, that the Treasury was challenging him. And uh, uh, in December, uh, operating under the new rule, he first did something that, uh, that was illegal by submitting a bid for somebody else that he could not have submitted if it had been aggregated with Solomon, for somebody that had totally innocent party. Who did? Who was that? Who was the uh, other? It was Warburg, I believe. That, Pardon me. I think it was it was the Warburg firm uh, that, that that he did that in. The Warburg they, firm. They are so an innocent party. As just, my let name. me let me just interject sure. so that we can get a clear understanding. So you're telling us then that in December, uh, Mr. Mosier actually submitted a bid for the Warburg firm that he was not authorized to do. As far as I know, Warburg had never. Uh, 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 Never heard of it. Uh, he just he pulled a name out of the hat, probably a name that he thought would might cause him the least trouble. But he but he he, uh, he submitted a bid for Warburg, which Warburg had nothing to do with. And then when he obtained a proration on the bonds for Warburg, as he did on pro, he, he he essentially transferred those over to the account of Solomon, so that Warburg never saw the bonds. I mean, they, they had no connection with it. And uh, he ended up with more bonds from that auction than he would have obtained if he'd only submitted a legitimate bid. Now, that was the first one, the first one we know of. And I, 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 mm -hmm. we've looked at 45 auctions, and we'll keep looking. And, and we've got other people helping us look. But in February, a couple of months later, he submitted three bids for 35 percent each 
totaling 105 percent of the issue. Would have been interesting if they'd all been awarded to him. Uh, the uh, used two other, uh, used two names, again unauthorized, to obtain far more bonds than he could have if he'd followed the rules and just submitting a legitimate 35 percent bid. Now, that triggered the second offense, triggered a Treasury reaction which led to the situation in late April where I think Mr. Mosier knew that events were underway that were going to cause him to be caught. And uh, uh, at that point, he informed his superior, who informed three other superiors, so that four people in senior management of the firm became aware of what Mr. Mosier had done. He said he'd only, according to the t what they tell us, he only told them of the one incident. Um, it really gets inexplicable at this point because clearly the whole thing was going to unravel at some point. The, 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 the Treasury was looking at it, uh, and Mr. Mosier then, in the May auction, uh, did the events, uh, did the things that uh, don't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's almost like a self-destruct mechanism. That they, there was no way that you were going to have a security behave as that May 22nd issue behaved in the aftermarket, which, uh, without attracting the attention of the whole world, journalists were writing about it. The SEC looked into it. it, it it, 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 it was not the act of a rational man at all. My, my time has expired, Mr. Buffett, and I appreciate your response. And I guess the only point I would make in summation here is, is that, that, that Mr. Mosier's superiors learned of his misconduct uh, as early as April. Late, in, and in then, late and April, then April, they learned subsequent of it. Subsequent to, to their learning of this, there was another auction where he had again repeated what he had done previously, in, sort of in spades. And... Uh, is that not the... That, that's correct. That is okay. correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for your indulgence also. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Buffett, I have a, a question not relevant to what you're doing right now at, uh, at Solomon, but relevant to how this committee and the Congress should, should proceed given the reauthorization. It seems to me that, uh, that there's a problem that exists here. We're in the 200th anniversary the, uh, the government bond market was created in 1791. And for an awful long time, we have sold an awful lot of debt, prosecute our wars, uh, our ambitious undertakings as, as a nation. And uh, we have now only over the last few years, uh, really almost a bit of a reluctant regulator. And could create the risk if Mr. Michael Basham, De Deputy Assistant uh, Treasury Secretary, is to believe, where the issuer of the bond will also be the regulator of the market into which it is sold. Because Treasury says, well, I'm not sure we need to do anything, but if you're going to do anything, it ought to be us. You have a breadth of experience. Can I ask you to react to that observation? Well, I don't think it's impossible for someone that is issuing, I guess counting all refundings and everything, um, many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars worth of bonds. They, they, audit, they should have, and, and I believe they do have, but they should have a definite interest in getting that done at the lowest possible cost, the lowest possible distribution cost, and with a minimization of, of an, an elimination, really, of any question about the integrity of that market. So. Uh, I would say the motivation would be there uh, to do that job. I, and, and, uh, I will tell you everything I know about, and, and continue to, everything I know about how the, the market operates. Uh, I'll let uh, you make the judgment when you get the facts in as to who can do the job best. I, I will go back to the fact that I absolutely believe that you should have tough rules, tough cops, and tough prosecution. Now, whatever gets that job done best, I think is, uh, uh, I'm for. <laughs> I guess my concern is, is that the secondary market seems to be the point of abuse. It's where you can go out and, and have some fun. And what were perceived to be tiny cracks really are big crevasses into which uh, most anything can, uh, 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 can fall. The GAO told us 
uh, that sales practice rules that supplement the basic anti-fraud provisions of the security laws have become a fixture. Quote, if these rules make sense for other securities markets, then they also make sense for the government market as well because there are similar opportunities for abuse. You concur with that GAO observation? Well, I would say there are opportunities for abuse. I would say that the government market is somewhat different than the equity market. It, 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 uh, you're dealing with almost homogeneous securities, not identical. I mean, they, they, they'll, but within any given maturity range, you're dealing with almost homogeneous securities. That is the reason why when the squeeze of sorts appeared in that May 22nd auction, everyone knew about it within a very short period of time. It, it, uh, it was obvious. You, you could look at the yield curve and you would see this one issue, 20 basis points out of line or something of the sort. You know that, that there's something going on in that issue. I, I should say, I do, I do not believe anyone, any group, could possibly rig the the Treasury market as a whole, but a given issue like that, I, I think there's some possibilities. I have one suggestion on that, incidentally. I, I, would, I would say this, that, that squeezes or corners have happened both accidentally and intentionally over the years. Probably the most famous one was the Northern Pacific Corner in 1901, which was accidental. You had two fellows that wanted to get control of a railroad, and they each bought more than half the stock, and that causes a problem. Uh, you've had plenty of people that have tried to intentionally uh, corner securities. The one thing that does in a corner or a squeeze is more supply. I mean, in the old days when they tried to squeeze uh, corn delivery in, in, in Chicago, they tried to keep the railroad cars from getting there, and if the railroad cars got there, it was, the corner was no good. And so the, an additional supply takes care of things, uh, and it, 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 as you put it, takes all the fun out of it. There, 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 there's no sense trying to squeeze or corner something except for profit. The, if the Treasury Treasury has a natural rhythm to its, its, its financing. Anybody that finances as much as they ought to should have a natural rhythm because you don't want to surprise markets. But I, if, and they're probably, like most simple solutions, there's probably something wrong with this, but I think if, if, if I were in a position to influence the policy, I would say that any time an issue appeared to be behaving abnormally in the market, I would, I would have the world on notice that the Treasury was prepared to issue a lot more of that particular security in one hell of a hurry. And essentially, I think the game would be over in terms of people trying to squeeze issues in the secondary market. If, if the people who did, who did what, whatever happened in the May 22nd auction had felt that the Treasury might come back a month later with 10 billion more of those notes, and bear in mind they were selling at too low a yield basis so that, in, in effect, it's kind of advantageous financing, well, it wouldn't have happened in the first place if that, if that willingness had been understood. So I think the very presence of that attitude would tend to, it, I think it would eliminate the squeeze problem. Now, that there, you've got a lot more problems than that, but I, I don't want to attack that specific point. I'm afraid, though, that Congress may rush out to go spend the money to incur the debt to issue that, uh, that new bond. <laughs> I thank, uh, thank the Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Buffett, I'm interested in what you possibly know about what the regulators knew about what was going on and, and when did they know it, paraphrase an old uh, expression. Um, I was reading the post today and I was trying to ascertain what uh, Chairman Breeden was saying about this in terms of, of the subpoenas, the subpoenas that, he has, uh, that he has issued and uh, I'm not sure about this but uh, some of the conclusions I, I would re reach it would be that the SEC waited until August to actually subpoena the market participants about their trading activities when in fact the Commission knew about those activities prior to that, possibly as early as May. Are you, are you familiar with any of the Commission's knowledge with this regard? Mr. McMillan, I'm, I'm really not familiar with, with their timetable. I know what Treasury did. Uh, that started the process in motion that caused the four people to be aware uh, at Solomon in late April. Uh, and I, I, I'm quite clear on that. I'm not clear in terms of the Department of Justice, in terms of, uh, in terms of the SEC. I'm not, I'm not clear on timing. Uh, uh, well, there was a letter request, I'm, and I remember this now, there was a letter request by the SEC 
in late June for information about the May 22nd auction. And, and, and uh, um, that is, uh, I, I know nothing about their internal procedures on timing after that. Well, let me back up a second. Just maybe uh, some of your, uh, your, your folks here could help us on this. But what I'm interested in, I mean, I understand that primary dealers make regular reports to the Federal Reserve about their positions. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is what kind of reporting was done to the regulators that if there was a real watchful eye, they could have picked this up. Uh, it seems to me, um, unless these reports were, uh, were uh, it, first, of, well, first question I want to ask, are there regular reports to some government agency that would indicate the kind of position that Solomon Brothers took uh, in these government auctions? Yeah, uh, and uh, if I may ask Mr. Petowitz, uh, on the, would they have been aware, would, the, 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 would reports have gone daily that would have shown, for example, the quantum position after May 22nd and, and showed the total held by Solomon for, for itself and customers? I or even earlier in some of the other transgressions? Yeah. The, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, would have re been receiving fairly regular reports about Solomon's positions and uh, would have been aware, was aware of the size of its position and its customers' positions at the end of May. So there is actual reporting that Solomon does to the Federal Reserve about its own account and its customer accounts to the Federal Reserve. Is that the only federal agency that would receive those kinds of reports? That is my understanding. So you're, what you're saying is that the Federal Reserve would have had the information in hand to have detected this back at its earliest date. They would have had information that would have permitted them to know the size of Salomon's and its customers' positions, but would not have had the ability, I believe, uh, to detect the illegality that was associated with uh, th that auction and earlier auctions. When was the first date that you heard from the Federal Reserve with regards to these problems? Approximately so. Uh, it's... it's uh, the problem I'm having with the question is the uh, suggestion that there was a problem. Uh, I th the Federal Reserve, I think, must have come, become concerned in May about the size of Salomon's position and its customers' positions. And uh, there were, as I understand it, informal discussions between the, uh, the government trading desk and the Federal Reserve concerning the size of those positions. Mm -hmm. And in addition, assurances were given that uh, these the government trading desk would not permit fails to occur uh, in the collateral market. Oh, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand before this committee goes forward with further legislation and further in encumbrances, what I'm trying to understand is, does, is the flow of information right now sufficient to federal regulators to have detected this kind of activity? And the answer to that I presumably is yes. Is that correct? I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the beginning is of the, the question. Is the flow of information to the federal regulators suffi sufficient to have detected uh, this kind, these kinds of positions? Insofar as the illegal bids are concerned, clearly not, because nobody could have known that except the people that were perpetrating the crimes. I see what you're saying. But insofar as the, um, the very large positions that were associated with, the, with May is concerned, right. that is the, uh, the Salomon position together with the customer positions, the Federal Reserve uh, was clearly aware of the size of the positions, and press reports suggest, uh, in addition, that the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and the SEC had begun to look at this uh, very carefully at the end of May and uh, had decided uh, that for reasons of investigation, um, that is, to watch how this played itself out a little while before uh, launching a full investigation. But in other words, the Federal Reserve knew in May that there were positions exceeding the 35 percent limit. Is that correct? No. No. Uh, what they would have been aware of is that Salomon had bid 35 percent and received very close to 35 percent, that uh, Quantum Fund bid 35 percent and received 35 percent, which they were entitled to, and that the Tiger Fund had um, apparently bid $2 billion and received $2 billion. And all these funds are related to? And who, who, who are the, these the bids were put in through Solomon, and Solomon uh, controlled uh, the, the collateral. And, oh. and, 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 and that, as I understand it, would have been available to the Federal Reserve, and that would, would have looked like a very big number, I would think. Well, again, I was trying to get to the, the heart of this, but I, again, I, the SEC uh, 
decided to subpoena the market participants in August when, in fact, maybe in May they may have seen the, the red flags? I think they did see the red flags in May uh, and in June, and the SEC had begun an investigation. I believe they were cooperating with the other agencies. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciate uh, giving us a better uh, understanding of some of the timing on this because, I, again, it's my concern that so much of this regulation is after the fact, oftentimes when it's in the press, and uh, I, I'm not sure that's a necessarily appropriate way to regulate our financial institutions by revelations in the newspaper. So I certainly appreciate your, uh, your comments in that regard. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Buffett, I read here a list of the management of the market by government regulators. For example, in the case of, the, of government securities, there is no review of the distribution process. But in the case of equities and corporate debt, there is. In the case of broker-dealer registration requirements, there is in each of the three markets, equities, corporate debt, and government securities. In the case of sales practice rules, there is no sales practice rules applicable or, or formulated by any regulator uh, with regard to people in government securities. But there are, there, there are such rules in the case of equities and corporate debt. In the case of broker-dealer personnel uh, testing, it is limited in the case of government securities, but it is, it is mandatory in the case of equities and corporate debt. Record-keeping requirements are available in all three of the markets. Financial reporting is available in all three remark uh, markets. Financial responsibility in all three. Limited, uh, limited SIPC coverage in the case of government securities, but there is a requirement for it in the case of equities and corporate debt. Uh, in the case of a surveillance program, which appears to be something which is very important, there is one in the equities market and in the corporate and and uh, none in the corporate debt but i note that there is no surveillance program in the government securities market i note that there is no large trader reporting in the case of government securities one is proposed in the case of equities and one in the case of corporate debt uh, there are no rules and no uh, by the commission or any self-regulatory agency of anti-manipulation rules in the case of government securities. Uh, in the case of equities, there is. Uh, and in the case of corporate debt, there are such rules. There is no requirement for trans transparency in the marketplace with regard to government securities. But uh, there, there is such authority in the case of each of equities and corporate debt. I'm curious. Uh, the 35 percent purchase that we, are, we have been discussing here, plus the purchase of, of other securities by uh, the same individual nominally for some, some, some other person, uh, apparently fell within the purview of what could be the uh, question of manipulation or anti-manipulation rules or manipulation of the market. A am I correct in that understanding? Well, it certainly seems to me that, that, that it's a crime. I don't, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what statute it comes under or anything of the sort, but, uh, but uh, so when somebody puts in a phony bid to the United States government for, uh, for uh, bonds trying to get around their rules as to the maximum that should be bid for, I, I, I don't, again, I don't know where it falls, but it should fall someplace. I'm not trying to put you in a, in a, in a pit. I want you to understand. This, 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 these, this is not a, a, a trap or question of that sort. I'm curious, though, uh, is your efforts to supervise, if you had anti-manipulation rules, you'd have an easier time, would you not? If you were the supervisor, you ought to have plenty of rules that take care of people doing what, what, what happened. But, um, and, and if you had a surveillance program, it'd be easier for the supervisors, would it not? Yes, but I, I, I agree with that, Mr. Chairman. I just don't know what the surveillance was, but I, uh, but I, uh, I agree that that when people are participating in a market that involves hundreds of billions of dollars, that, that there should be a surveillance program. And I noted again that there, that there are uh, no, no sales practice rules 
Again, for your supervision, that kind of uh, rule would be easier uh, for you to supervise if you had such rules in place by an appropriate federal regulatory institution. Would, would no, we're going to have plenty of rules of our own, in, but I don't. Uh, that you know, I, I think that uh, government rules should be a, a, the appropriate ones and the minimum ones, and we hope to go beyond it. Now, I note again, there's no distribution, uh, no review of the distribution process in the case of government securities. Uh, again, your task in supervising uh, people would be made easier if you had something of that kind available. Yeah. Would it not? I'm not sure whether we do we supply the names of all purchasers to the to the Fed. Yeah, I, I, my my impression is that the that in terms of the distribution that does take place, unless somebody is cheating and 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 puts a phony ticket in and then as happened at, at Solomon in several cases, uh, I think that uh, I, I do think the Federal Reserve does receive the name of purchasers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Let me ask you this, Mr. Buffett, in conclusion. Could you give us a one-minute summary of what you want us to remember as your core message as we move through uh, the legislative process and, uh, and consider also expansion of further deregulatory matters, uh, uh, areas of the banking uh, uh, industry over this uh, coming fall. I guess I'm not sure I can drag it out to one minute, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do believe in, when, with markets of this size, equities, debt, whatever, the integrity of markets uh, is uh, paramount. And I think that we will always have uh, people who misbehave in our midst and probably uh, uh, too many will be attracted to large markets, but that uh, the presence of uh, tough rules and tough cops, sure and swift prosecution, is probably the best thing that can be done to minimize it. Mr. Buffett, uh, we thank you. Uh, you once wrote, I believe, in the Washington Post, uh, that if you uh, really wanted to make money, hold your nose and head towards Wall Street. Uh, while your, the timing and the purpose of your trip to Wall Street may not have been similarly uh, motivated, I hope that you can keep your hand on, the, uh, on your own nose and the other firmly on the rudder of Solomon Brothers uh, as you uh, continue to be in the vanguard of reform. Uh, not only in your own firm, but across this entire marketplace. And I think that your legacy can, ben, can be of one of tremendous public service. Uh, and uh, and I, I want to tell you that we admire and respect you for what you've done in the past and, uh, and for your cooperation here today. Thank, Thank you, you very Chairman. much, Mr. Buffett. Um, our second uh, uh, panel uh, consists of the uh, federal uh, regulators who have a jurisdiction. Uh, in this uh, area. They consist of the Honorable Richard Breeden, Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, Mr. E. Gerald Corrigan, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the Honorable David W. Mullins, Jr., Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and the Honorable Jerome H. Powell, Assistant Secretary for Domestic Finance, here from the Department of Treasury. If each of you could please uh, move to the witness table behind the uh, name uh, card uh, which uh, has been placed there for your convenience. Do you want to do that also? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Where are the other witnesses? Are they in here? <laughs> We are taking a brief pause while the regulators continue to coordinate their testimony, um, if not their response to the, uh, to the uh, need for reform in the marketplace.
Green was in your office. He didn't want to wait here. Okay, fine. first All right, I think we uh, now have a, a full complement and uh, we can uh, now proceed as a result with our uh, second uh, panel, uh, which uh, consists of the uh, relevant uh, regulators of this uh, marketplace and uh, the answers, we hope, uh, to this immediate problem and to the longer term uh, policy changes which uh, uh, should be implemented in order to assure that there is not a recurrence. Um, we're uh, especially pleased that uh, uh, Mr. E. Gerald Corrigan, who is the president of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, is, is uh, paying us a uh, return visit on such short notice. He testified earlier in the spring before the subcommittee with regard to the need to continue to s separate commerce from banking. Uh, in the financial marketplace. Mr. Corrigan, your uh, insight into this area uh, uh, in need of reform could uh, as well be very helpful uh, to this subcommittee and full committee as we move forward on a legislative package in this area as well. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit my prepared it's a deep baritone, but not that deep. If you could turn on your microphone. Thank there. you, sir. Is that, is that better? I'd like to ask, Mr. Chairman, that my entire statement to the subcommittee be submitted to the record, but I'd like to touch in a few minutes here on a couple of aspects of it, including uh, one that is directly germane to several of the questions that you raised in your letter of invitation. But let me be first say a few words about the so-called primary dealers and the relationship between those institutions and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. As you know, the primary dealers in government securities are the institutions with whom the Federal Reserve Bank of New York conducts its open market operations. They are also the main market makers for government debt and that they maintain two-way markets for government securities and participate directly in the Treasury's auctions. Today there are about 40 primary dealers, about half of which are banks and half are securities companies or diversified financial firms. All Federal Reserve transactions in the marketplace, whether for its own account or for the account of other official institutions are conducted with the primary dealers. And again, to give you some scope of that, during 1990, for example, our overall transactions with these institutions were about $500 billion. Now, the mere fact that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York must conduct transactions with private sector counterparties implies of necessity that the bank incurs the same elements of counterparty credit, delivery, and settlement risk that any private sector market participant also incurs. For this reason, the bank has established criteria for selecting those firms with whom it will do business. It should also be noted that in several other major industrial countries, there are broadly similar arrangements in place. 
Now, it's important to note that the role of the bank in its business relationships with the primary dealers takes place in a framework in which the Federal Reserve has no express statutory authority to regulate or supervise the primary dealers. But while the bank does not have statutory rulemaking authority or enforcement authority in this area, we recognize that our public responsibilities in nature carry with it certain implicit responsibilities to work closely with those having such authority in order to preserve, if not enhance, the health and vitality of the market. Now, the number of primary dealers has varied over the years. It was 18 in the early 60s, in the mid-20s, in the 70s, got to 31 in 1981, and peaked at 46 in 1988. Uh, and since then, it has shrunk back uh, to about 40 in number. Now, from time to time, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has carefully considered possible changes in its approach to the selection of those entities with whom it will do business. Those deliberations, however, always collide head-on with two realities that seem to limit practical alternatives to current arrangements. First, the fact that we must deal with private sector counterparties necessarily implies that some will be chosen and some will not. Second, the fact that some will be chosen and others not necessarily implies that whether they are called primary dealers or not, the, the unique relationship between the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and those entities with whom it does business. Now, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> turn as requested in your letter to an, an overview of the specific events surrounding the Solomon Brothers' disclosures of Oct August 9th through August 19th. On Friday, August 9th, top officials at Solomon Brothers telephoned the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, me to be specific, and almost simultaneously faxed to the bank a copy of the firm's August 9th press release. Prior to that phone call, the bank had no knowledge of wrongdoing then or subsequently disclosed by Solomon. However, in the normal review of the bids for the Treasury's five-year note auction, <clears throat> an employee of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had noted that another dealer firm had submitted a bid which if added to the bid submitted by Solomon Brothers for an affiliate of that same second dealer firm would have placed that entity's consolidated bid over the Treasury 35 percent limit. The New York Fed notified the Treasury of that finding, and the Treasury subsequently wrote to Solomon's customer, with a copy to Solomon, informing it that all of its affiliates would be considered a single entity for purposes of the rules. The circumstances surrounding these events strongly suggest I think Mr. Buffett's testimony just confirmed this, that it was the receipt by Solomon of the copy of the Treasury letter triggered in the first instance by the report to the Treasury by the New York Fed that prompted that senior official at Solomon to disclose to his superiors the fact of the unauthorized bid in the February auction. Despite this disclosure within the firm, the fact of the unauthorized bid was not disclosed to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or any other official institution until that telephone call of August 9, 1991. While not directly the subject of Solomon Brothers' August 9th press release, there was a considerable amount of discussion between officials of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and Solomon Brothers in the period after the Treasury's May two-year note auction. In that time frame, there was no evidence that Solomon had breached the 35 percent rule in the May auction. There was, however, concern in the marketplace and in official circles that the auction results seemed to have created a squeeze in the market for that particular issue. Those concerns prompted the SEC, in consultation with the Treasury and the Fed, to commence an in-depth review and investigation into the May two-year note auction and its market aftermath. Given the amount of attention and discussion that surrounded the May auction, 
The disclosures made by Solomon during the course of the Friday, August 9 telephone call were particularly unsettling, especially as it pertained to top management's knowledge since late April of the unauthorized bid in the February auction. On the basis of the disclosures made by Solomon on August 9th, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York informed Solomon by letter on Tuesday, August 13th, that it wanted a written explanation of the circumstances surrounding the disclosures made on August 9th, and a full report on managerial and other changes that would be taken to prevent a reoccurrence of those irregularities in the, fut in the future. Early in the evening, of Tuesday, August 13th, we received another call from top management at Solomon. At that time, further disclosures of irregularities were made, and those irregularities were the subject of the press statement issued by Solomon Brothers on Wednesday, August 14th. On the basis of the August 14th disclosures, there were further discussions between the top officials of Solomon Brothers and myself on the evening of Thursday, August 15th, and the morning of Friday, August 16th. During the discussions on Friday morning, it became clear that the two top officers of the firm intended to resign and that Mr. Buffett would take on the position of interim chairman over the weekend. In the face of those important changes in top management and the strong commitments made to me personally by the incoming chairman, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York deemed it appropriate to provide the firm with a limited amount of additional time to respond to the questions raised in the bank's letter <coughs> of August 13th. Over the entire period, from the first call late in the morning of Friday, August 9th, to the New York Fed, through the conversations with the bank on the morning of August 16th, the bank kept the Federal Reserve Board, the Treasury, and the Securities and Exchange Commission informed as to the nature of all of these conversations. Over this same interval, officials at the Federal Reserve worked closely with the SEC and law enforcement entities in the sharing of information and the shaping of concepts and approaches to the investigations then underway. All such discussions occurred in the context of full cooperation and strong working relationships between the three official agencies and the Justice Department. Over the course of Sunday, August 18th, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was in constant contact with the Treasury, the Board of Governors, <coughs> and Solomon Brothers. The bank was fully aware of the decisions taken by the Treasury in regard to the extent of Solomon's ability to participate in Treasury auctions, and it regarded all such decisions as appropriate. The bank shared the view that the decision to permit Solomon to continue to participate in auctions for its own account was appropriate in the light of the further management changes that were announced on Sunday the 18th, as well as the further assurances received uh, as to the future course of conduct by the firm. Throughout all of these discussions, however, the New York Fed was mindful <coughs> that the nature and extent of its future business relationship with the firm were under review, and the bank made that quite clear to all, including to the new management of the firm. In looking at the acknowledgments by the firm since that first statement on August 9th regarding wrongdoings in the auctions of December 90 and February 91, <coughs> and especially, in fact, in view of the fact that the latter was known to top management in April, one can only be shocked and dismayed by this sequence of events. Having said that, it will take some time for the various criminal and civil proceedings to sort themselves out in a setting in which due process must be allowed to run its course. Similarly, some breathing room is needed for the new management of the firm to be able to respond in detail as to what steps it plans to take for the future. Finally, we and the other authorities must rigorously evaluate these changes. In the meantime, <clears throat> one cannot help but be impressed with the sweeping management changes that have already been made and with the strength of the new management's commitment to proper behavior and strengthen management and control systems. 
In these circumstances, while awaiting the results of the investigations now underway, it seems to me premature to come forward with any broad-based plans for regulatory changes or legislative proposals. <coughs> In the coming weeks, we intend to coordinate closely with officials of the Treasury, the SEC, and of course the Fed in Washington in reviewing these options. We will be looking toward these issues with an eye toward developing a coherent approach that deals with the abuses that have come to light, but does so in a manner that recognizes the need to proceed carefully to protect the overall desirable elements of this important market. We would aim to have recommendations within 90 days, although on certain more limited points, it may be possible to move sooner. With a carefully thought out and implemented approach, we believe, and I certainly believe, that it will be feasible to maintain the integrity and efficiency of this final market. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corgan. And uh, now we'll hear from Mr. Mullins, Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, Board in Washington. Mr. Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Slattery. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am pleased to be here today to testify in connection with the regulation of the government securities market. The Board of Governors considers the U.S. government securities market the most important securities market in the world. Though an important market, the Board of Governors has little direct regulatory authority for the U.S. government securities market. The Board does retain general oversight responsibility for all Federal Reserve District Bank activities in this area. Moreover, the Board of Governors here in Washington bears the ultimate responsibility for determining overall policy for the Federal Reserve System with respect to this market and other matters. Because of these responsibilities and the importance of this market, the Board is committed to participate actively in the process of ensuring and enhancing the efficiency and integrity of this market. And it is because of the importance of the market for U.S. government securities that the events of recent months are of such concern. While it has been extraordinarily resilient and has continued to function well over this period, this episode underscores the importance of ensuring the integrity of this market. Of course, we must not overlook the fact that existing enforcement mechanisms appear to have been instrumental in this unfolding episode. Although senior Solomon Brothers officials were aware of rule violations months before, the firm finally admitted wrongdoing only under the pressure of these advancing enforcement processes. <coughs> And, of course, these enforcement processes continue to move forward as we meet here today. It is already apparent to all observers that the consequences of willful violations in this area are quite severe indeed. While this has been a troubling episode, it is not apparent that sweeping changes in regulation are warranted. It is clear that tightening up on enforcement would be efficacious in detecting and deterring future offenses. For example, the Federal Reserve regularly receives information on dealer positions in when issued securities. These reports were not actively monitored from an enforcement perspective because they were not designed for enforcement purposes. Nonetheless, closer attention to them may be helpful in the future in raising questions about situations with possible enforcement implications. The Federal Reserve is committed to ensuring active monitoring of all incoming data and prompt referral of uh, anomalous findings to appropriate regulatory authority and indeed surveillance and enfor enforcement activities have already been intensified. And yet this episode has raised concerns that go beyond the straightforward process of detecting and punishing wrongdoing. Some have felt that the fairness of the market has been called into question. Others have raised concerns about the efficiency of market mechanisms. The smooth functioning of this market in recent months demonstrates that there appears to have been no economically meaningful loss of confidence in this market as yet. Nonetheless, these concerns need to be addressed, reduce confidence in the fairness and efficiency of the government securities market, 
could potentially impair liquidity and raise the cost of Treasury financing. This episode has presented us with an opportunity to undertake a thorough analysis of the structure of this market and its regulations. I also believe that, it's important that these important issues should not be considered in haste, nor should changes be considered in a piecemeal manner. The issues are too complex and too interrelated, and the consequences of mistakes too severe for us to rush to judgment on fundamental issues of market structure and reform. With well over $2 trillion in Treasury debt held by the public, the stakes are high and the consequences of mistakes are severe. Should either concerns about market integrity or inappropriate regulation raise the interest cost on Treasury debt even one basis point, one one hundredth of a percentage point, this would aggregate into more than 200 million in increased interest costs every year, which must be borne by U.S. taxpayer. <coughs> Time is needed for a careful analytical approach to the issues of market structure and regulation. What is needed is a rigorous, comprehensive, coordinated review of government securities markets with the objective of finding ways to ensure and enhance the efficiency and integrity of the market. A wide range of issues should be on the table. It may well be that upon review, significant changes will be found to be in order. At this point, however, conclusions would be premature. The issues are complex and interrelated, investigations are not yet completed, and the data needed to make informed judgments are still being gathered. The Department of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the SEC have agreed to undertake intensive examination of market practices, structure, and regulation, culminating in recommendations for changes needed to ensure and enhance the efficiency and integrity of the market. As President Corrigan noted, we would expect this review to take place over a span of 90 days. Our timetable need not serve as an impediment to action on the Government Securities Act. The legislative process can usefully go forward on extending Treasury's rulemaking authority and addressing other concerns that are already on the table. Uh, in our view, disclosures to date about wrongdoing in this market have not fundamentally altered the Board's views the Board's views conveyed in letters, congressional testimony earlier this year on the amendments that have been proposed with respect to Government Securities Act. Specifically, we continue to support the recommendation that Treasury's rulemaking authority be extended past its current sunset date. Beyond that, however, we do not feel the, that the need for additional legislation calling for sales practice rules or mandating dissemination of information has been decisively demonstrated, nor has the Solomon episode produced evidence of such a need. In sum, Mr. Chairman, recent events have raised troubling questions about the U.S. government securities market. These concerns must be addressed. A thorough and thoughtful investigation is the first step in the process. Ultimately, a careful and wide-ranging examination of the government securities market with the goal of enhancing its efficiency and fairness will be an important input to our consideration of the appropriate changes in this market. Though I am deeply concerned about recent revelations and await results of ongoing investigations, I do not believe the government securities market is broken in any fundamental sense. I do, however, believe it can be improved, and the Board of Governors is committed to this end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mullins. Um, the third, third panelist today is the Honorable Jerome Powell, Assistant Secretary for Domestic uh, Finance uh, with the Department of the Treasury. Mr. Powell, are you prepared? Yes, I am. You can commence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ronaldo. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to discuss the oversight and regulation of the government securities market in light of Solomon Brothers' recently admitted violations of auction rules and that firm's possible violations of securities laws, antitrust laws, general fraud statutes, SEC regulations, and New York Stock Exchange rules. A written testimony, which I submit for the record, discusses in detail Treasury auctions, including the role of primary dealers and significant auction rules, a chronology of developments concerning the February and May auctions, and discussion of regulatory issues. Uh, your written statement and the written statement of all of our witnesses will be included 
in the record in its entire entirety without objection. Please continue. I have a, a brief oral statement that I'll read. While regulation of the government securities markets can be improved, the responsibilities of the various regulators are, we believe, reasonably well defined. With respect to the auctions, the Treasury determines the amounts and maturities of the securities to be auctioned and sets the auction rules. The Federal Reserve conducts the auctions as Treasury's agent, and together the Treasury and the Federal Reserve review bids for compliance. Both the Treasury and the Federal Reserve have powerful but limited sanctions available to them to punish violators of these rules. The Treasury, for example, has forbidden Solomon Brothers to bid in auctions on behalf of its customers. Securities fraud, in the form of deliberate violations of auction rules accompanied by false statements to the Treasury, and antitrust violations are more generally the enforcement responsibility of the self-regulatory organizations, the SEC, and the Justice Department. In addition, price manipulation and other types of secondary market fraud are also the enforcement responsibility of the SEC and the Justice Department. We believe that these agencies' legal authority to prosecute fraud and antitrust violations in Treasury auctions is beyond question. However, at a minimum, Treasury would support modifications to current law to strengthen enforcement of Treasury auction rules by providing that violations of these rules would also constitute violations of the securities laws. All government securities brokers and dealers, including those that are financial institutions, are subject to regulation pursuant to the Government Securities Act of 1986. Under that act, the Treasury was given the role as the rulemaker for government securities brokers and dealers. In its rulemaking capacity, Treasury issued rules for government securities brokers and dealers that adopted many of the existing SEC regulations that already applied to registered brokers and dealers. The responsibility for enforcing these rules was given to the SEC and the self-regulatory organizations for non-financial institution brokers and dealers, and to the appropriate federal banking agencies for financial institutions. Solomon Brothers is, therefore, subject to comprehensive regulation. As a registered broker-dealer and member firm of the New York Stock Exchange, it is subject to all SEC and New York Stock Exchange rules, as well as Treasury rules under the Government Securities Act. Based on the recent admissions by Solomon Brothers, it is possible that the firm violated record-keeping and customer confirmation requirements, as well as other requirements that the SEC and the New York Stock Exchange have full authority to enforce. Moreover, any allegations of market manipulation or securities fraud, if true, would be a violation of securities laws that the SEC has the authority to enforce. Like all persons and entities, Solomon Brothers and its employees are subject to the antitrust laws and to general fraud statutes. Violations of these provisions could result in criminal prosecution by the Justice Department. As a general matter, the current regulatory structure has usually worked well. And yet the recent revelations of intentional wrongdoing have raised legitimate concerns about the integrity of the marketplace and about the adequacy of regulation and supervision. The ongoing investigations of misconduct are broad ranging. We believe that it is appropriate to conduct an equally careful review of the adequacy of current regulation with the goal of maintaining the highest standards of integrity while also preserving the liquidity, efficiency, and depth of the government securities markets. We would expect to complete such a review and to report its results to the Congress within 90 days. In the interim period, we believe that all parties involved, including the regulators, market participants, and the Congress, should exercise restraint. The market for U.S. government securities is the largest, most liquid, and most important financial market in the world. It is the means by which we, by which we finance the national debt. Moreover, it is the bedrock of the world financial system. It is essential that the integrity of this marketplace be beyond question and that there be adequate regulation to ensure that integrity. But it is also essential that hasty action not impair the liquidity and competitiveness of U.S. financial markets. Questions have also arisen, finally, as to the status of the Treasury's rulemaking authority under the Government Securities Act, which will lapse unless reauthorized by October 1. In the view of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the SEC, it is important that there be no such lapse in rulemaking authority. We therefore urge that the reauthorization take place on schedule or the Treasury's rulemaking authority be temporarily extended beyond the October 1 sunset date. And that concludes my oral remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powell, very much. Uh, and our uh, cleanup witness, uh, the Chairman of the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, Richard Breed. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ronaldo, uh, members of the subcommittee, it is um, 
<clears throat> As always, a pleasure to have an opportunity to appear before this committee. Uh, I regret the circumstances that bring me here today, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity provided by this subcommittee and its determination to begin examining into the facts and circumstances uh, relating to the revelations by Solomon Brothers as to trading in government uh, in the government securities market. At the outset, I would like to note that the Commission is in the midst of an extremely active and wide-ranging investigation of the conduct of Solomon and other participants in the market for government securities. The Commission has issued more than 135 subpoenas and requests for information as part of its investigation. Solomon itself has admitted publicly that it is engaged in serious misconduct associated with the auction process for Treasury securities. Because the Commission's investigation is continuing, I must be circumspect with respect to my description of non-public matters that may become the subject of actions by the Commission or, as I would expect may be the case, by criminal authorities. <clears throat> the Commission's investigation of events and practices relating to Solomon commenced virtually immediately after the Treasury Department notified us on May the 29th that there was a possibility of wrongdoing in connection with the May 22nd auction of $12 billion in two-year Treasury notes. Following this notification and related news accounts of a possible squeeze in the market for these notes, the Commission, in conjunction with the Treasury Department, began active monitoring of the market for the notes. The central focus of our early concern was possible concerted action by a group of purchasers in the auction to manipulate the market. The Treasury's notification to us on May 29th was the first indication that we received of any suspicions by the Treasury or by the Federal Reserve regarding wrongful conduct associated with Treasury auctions in general or the practices of Solomon in particular. In the weeks that followed uh, this initial uh, notification to us, the Commission has coordinated its efforts with, and I might add we have enjoyed the full cooperation of the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve Board here in Washington, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and other agencies. The Commission has also worked very closely and harmoniously with the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice and with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. Following the Treasury's notification and the related news accounts of a possible squeeze in the market, the Commission began actively monitoring for the notes, the market for the notes, we found that the price of the notes continued to be high in relation to that of other two-year notes. During the ensuing weeks, the Commission, with the help of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, also identified the purchasers of all large awards in the auction of the notes. To avoid alerting the participants in that market, and who may have been the participants in a collusive scheme, of the fact that their behavior was being monitored and that the Commission would subsequently uh, collect uh, evidence concerning their transactions, uh, we deliberately delayed uh, the issuance of formal requests for information to some of those large purchasers uh, in the auction. And I might add that that strategy and uh, conclusion uh, was uh, discussed uh, with the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, and I think all agencies at the time agreed that that was an appropriate uh, result. We did not want to alert uh, some of the um, persons who would be subject to our later uh, uh, formal investigative processes uh, before uh, subsequent actions in the marketplace that might give evidence of collusive behavior uh, would have occurred. Following a period of weeks, uh, in late June to be specific, the Division of Enforcement contacted Solomon and the other major purchasers in the May Treasury auction concerning their activities in the when issued market, the auction, and the secondary market for the notes. And I might add, these contacts are not merely a phone call. This represents a detailed written request for specific information. It is a normal uh, process on our part to issue uh, uh, requests for information uh, particularly to regulated broker-dealers, without necessarily uh, including that request initially in a subpoena uh, if there is not full and complete uh, uh, compliance with such requests, a uh, subpoena will immediately follow. But the process of active evidence gathering began in late June following our period of monitoring the market that I already mentioned. During the uh, 
during July and into early August, the Commission conducted uh, numerous discussions with market participants and we began to review the submissions of information that were coming in to us. During this process, the Commission obtained information from a customer of Solomon indicating that there was a discrepancy between the actual amount of that customer's bid and the amount reflected on the auction tender form submitted by Solomon to the New York Federal Reserve Bank. This was our first indication of discrepancies of this kind, uh, indications uh, back in February of this year concerning the uh, apparent discrepancies regarding bids on behalf of uh, an affiliate of S.G. Warburg and Company had not been uh, mentioned or relayed to us, and we hadn't been aware of those events uh, last February. Further, information concerning positions in when issued trading supplied by the New York Federal Reserve Bank indicated that Solomon may have had a net long position of over $200 million before the May 22nd auction, contrary to its representation to the New York Fed that its position was under $200 million. On August the 9th, Solomon advised the Commission and issued a press release indicating that it had discovered irregularities in connection with certain Treasury auctions. The Commission thereupon issued a formal order of investigation and issued uh, many of the, uh, as I mentioned, more than 135 uh, uh, letters and subpoenas that uh, to date have gone out. Uh, those uh, uh, requests for documentation have now gone, in addition to Solomon and its customers, to every primary dealer in government securities, to many of their major customers, and uh, to certain employees of firms and others uh, concerning activities in Treasury auctions. We have already received at least partial responses and documents from most primary dealers in response to our requests. Though we have not yet had an opportunity to analyze fully all the information that we have obtained so far or reached any enforcement conclusions, the Commission's investigation will be thorough. We intend to get to the bottom of what happened not only in Solomon, but to investigate fully uh, the issues of whether that conduct was an isolated occurrence or represented part of a broader and more common pattern. While I hope that the revelations about Solomon's, uh, Solomon's conduct relating to Treasury au auctions will prove to be isolated and aberrational occurrences, we do not believe that we can afford to leave lingering doubts in the minds of investors about the integrity and fairness of the market for U.S. Treasury securities. I have met personally at length with the new chairman of Solomon, Warren Buffett, and with his new chief operating officer, Derek Maughan. They have assured me unequivocally, as they assured the committee here today, that Solomon will make every possible effort to cooperate fully with our investigation, to help us uncover all transgressions that may have occurred, that they will discharge any individual found to have participated in any misconduct, and that they will revise the firm's policies and procedures as necessary to prevent a recurrence of these problems. They have made these undertakings without discussion or negotiation concerning any penalties that may be forthcoming. These actions cannot eliminate the firm's responsibility for any violations of the law that it may have committed. However, the strong steps taken by the firm to replace management and to alter the firm's practices in a fundamental manner deserve recognition. At a minimum, these steps should make it possible for customers and others who deal directly with Solomon in the marketplace to avoid overreaction to the disclosures about the firm's practices until all the facts are known and the government's action with respect to appropriate penalties uh, can be taken. One of the most troubling aspects of Solomon's revelations is that according to Solomon, its previous senior management knew about the misconduct at the firm as early as April of this year. Despite this knowledge, the problems relating to the May auction were allowed to occur and to persist for a period of weeks. Only after the firm received information requests from our Division of Enforcement and other agencies and became aware of the Commission's investigation and that of other agencies did senior management choose to act. Without seeking to draw at this time any conclusions whatsoever regarding whether the law was violated and if so, by whom, the firm's silence throughout this time frame raises serious questions about whether there was a climate within Solomon that appeared to tolerate or even to encourage wrongdoing. 
Public trust and confidence are critical to financial firms, though this appears to be a fact that is not adequately understood in some institutions. Obviously, the laws and regulations applicable to our financial markets are complex, and good faith problems may occur in even the very best firms. However, it is not an adequate ethical standard, in my personal judgment, for a financial firm simply to avoid indictment. Rather, those in positions of leadership have, as perhaps their very highest duty, the establishment of an environment in which a strong code of ethics prevails in the firm's dealings with customers, counterparties, and the market as a whole. Hopefully, a strong code of ethics will prevent a firm from knowingly even approaching the limits of unlawful conduct. Where problems do occur, however, it should be seen as the personal obligation of every chief executive officer to make an immediate and full investigation of the possible wrongdoing, to report it promptly to the appropriate regulatory bodies, and to take corrective action. Certainly, the legal rights of every individual and corporation must be scrupulously respected and due process fully observed. However, prompt and vigorous public accountability for willful unlawful acts should be seen as the responsibility of the firm itself and not just of the government. Where those codes of ethics and individual uh, firm uh, decision-making break down, I might add, it is the responsibility of the government to provide an appropriate response, and we have every intention of doing so in this case. Over the next 90 days, as indicated by the other uh, panelists here today, the Commission intends to work with the Federal Reserve and with the Treasury to re-examine the government securities market. In the interim, uh, I would concur in the recommendations that the existing rulemaking authority of the Treasury should not be allowed to expire and that either the Government Securities Act should be reauthorized uh, or the current sunset date should be extended so that we do not have any lapse of current law uh, during the period in which we are conducting a, a larger and more wide-ranging reexamination of the statute itself. More comprehensive action for the future clearly will need to be taken. Uh, at the time in which uh, we move to permanently reauthorize the Government Securities Act, uh, I do believe that there are changes that will need to be made, though we, of course, uh, do wish to await the results of further uh, studies, as has been discussed, in deciding uh, precisely which reforms ought to be made. But as a minimum, I would like to mention three items that we do believe should be ultimately included in any reform of the Government Securities Act. First, the Commission believes that it would be useful to supplement the generalized anti-fraud and anti-manipulation provisions contained now in Section 10B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 with a provision that specifically makes it unlawful to utilize false or inaccurate information in the making of bids in Treasury auctions or in, connect in connection with the distribution of any government security. This would supplement current authority under the general anti-fraud provisions and foster compliance efforts by government securities dealers themselves, as well as examination and enforcement efforts by the Commission and the self-regulatory organizations. Second, the Commission believes that the Congress should remove the restrictions on the authority of the NASD to impose sales practice rules on transactions in government securities. This would extend the protections that are currently in place for investors in all other types of uh, in all other securities markets to investors in government securities who participate in that market for a number of reasons, but in many cases, precisely because of its reputation for safety, we do not believe we should continue with a situation in which uh, the market for supposedly the safest securities is the one in which there are the least uh, protections against sales practice abuses. Third, the Commission recommends that Congress uh, uh, ultimately adopt, uh, as part of any legislation, uh, some authority to allow uh, government agencies to promote improved transparency in the government securities market in the event that current private efforts along those lines do not achieve adequate success. Such authority will ensure that if private sector efforts are unsuccessful, the government will be in a position to act to ensure adequate information is available to all market participants. And I might add that we have found in case after case and in many, many areas of the securities laws that sunlight is one of the most powerful disinfectants and one of the most powerful tools to promote compliance with the law. And we think that uh, through better 
price and transaction reporting mechanisms in this market, we can probably uh, create a stronger uh, compliance and environment, uh, environment for compliance. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the Commission shares the Committee's concerns in preserving the integrity of the Treasury auction system, which has enabled the Treasury to meet ever-increasing needs for government financing. I can assure you that we will continue our investigation vigorously. In fact, we believe that our investigation is partly responsible for Solomon's disclosures, and we are determined to develop a full understanding of what violations occurred, whether they were isolated events, or whether they were part of a broader pattern. We will do everything we can to remove the cloud of uncertainty that has been placed over this market. The American public and market participants from around the world should have confidence that the scope of wrongdoing will be determined and that unlawful conduct that may have occurred will not be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Breeden, very much. And we thank each of the uh, witnesses for their uh, testimony. And uh, the Chair will now recognize himself for a round of questions and uh, begin by noting that uh, I as well subscribe to Justice Brandeis' uh, dicta that uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Uh, that is, in fact, the, uh, the goal of uh, legislation uh, which this uh, subcommittee is uh, considering in no manner, shape, or form do we believe that information uh, out in the public domain, in the hands of regulators, in the hands of taxpayers, in the hands of investors, should in any manner, shape, or form inhibit legitimate uh, economic activity. Uh, we do not believe they, that they are at odds, but rather we believe that they work hand in glove uh, to ensure that the taxpayer has to, in fact, uh, pay the smallest bill on April 15th for the money which we have to borrow in order to keep this deficit uh, uh, afloat and at the same time uh, in any way have to impede the information which investors get uh, to ensure that they are, in fact, dealing in a safe a sound and honest marketplace. So the question, in fact, uh, arises, um, how did this occur? How, in fact, did the consistent, repeated, blatant, willful violations of the rules governing the most important financial marketplace in our country and, in fact, in the world occur? And I think that uh, it could perhaps be helpful for us to walk through what, in fact, has been the relationship uh, of the various regulatory agencies uh, throughout uh, this entire uh, episode. In particular, uh, uh, I'm concerned with the reactions uh, of regulators in the period of last spring. Uh, my understanding is that the Treasury Department first noticed irregular activity in March following the February 21st, 1991 auction for five-year notes. Can you tell me first uh, why there was no contact, Mr. Powell, with Solomon Brothers at that time, given that the bids involved were submitted by Solomon? That, that is, I, I don't believe that's an accurate uh, 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 statement of the, the facts as they emerged in, around the February auction. Uh, the, the first phony bids were submitted in the uh, in the February auction, I believe on the day of the auction, the New York Fed did contact Solomon Brothers, and uh, I think a, a Treasury representative also either that day or shortly thereafter contacted Solomon to inquire uh, about the, the two Warburg bids. Um, subsequently, Treasury wrote a letter on April 17th uh, clarifying a ruling as to the related party status. So on what date then, Mr. Powell, did the Treasury and the Fed contact Solomon Brothers verbally? The day uh, of the verbally? auction the day of the auction. That fact, is on it, February 21st? At 1.30 in the afternoon, I believe. And who did you uh, correspond with at that time? Who did you contact? Well, I, I think Solomon actually it was Brothers. a representative of the Fed that talked directly to Solomon. We talked to the Fed. Mr. Cargan, who did uh, the uh, New York Fed speak to at Solomon uh, on February 21st? I can't, <clears throat> I can't give you the name, but let me, if I can, just try and elaborate a little bit further. When the, when the bids come in, they have to be submitted to us by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And in order to <clears throat> ensure an orderly market reaction to the bidding price process, we have one hour from 1 to 2 to review those bids because the auction results are announced at 2 o'clock. Uh, in, in, the, in the particular case in question, the 
Solomon customer bid, as I recall, spoke only of the customer Wahlberg. It was not <clears throat> Wahlberg with PLC or Inc., and it was not even uh, one of its uh, um, mutual fund types. <clears throat> um, in those circumstances, it had also occurred that Wahlberg, the parent, had submitted a small bid of its own in its own capacity as, as a primary dealer. And the two of them were over 35%. What was not clear at that precise point in time is whether, in fact, the Wahlberg entities that were the subject of the bids were, in fact, separate legal entities or whether under the Treasury rules they were a single entity. That could not be determined at that precise point in time. Was there any continuing verbal contact then maintained between the New York Fed and the Solomon Brothers uh, subsequent that? to that afternoon conversation of February 21st uh, that uh, initiated this discussion? From that point on, I think it's, it's fair to say that it was the Treasury. Indeed, I think the Treasury, in fact, even I think Senate Representative to London or was in touch with Warburg, certainly in London, trying to determine the exact legal status of the entities that were subject to the questioning of the bid. What we're very interested in, as you can imagine, is the procedures which were implemented between that uh, February 21st at 1.30 in the afternoon right. contact uh, between the New York Fed and the Solomon Brothers. And would be very interested if you could provide for the record uh, who it was at Solomon that uh, you contacted at that time. And the letter which was uh, finally written on April 17th. And what we're looking for uh, is, in fact, the interrelationship between the Treasury and the New York Fed uh, and the SEC uh, in coordinating this inquiry as to the suspicious activity, which you had identified uh, as of that afternoon, February 21st, and what actions were taken. So, Mr. Powell, um, Mr. Corrigan says any subsequent ac actions were then taken at Treasury. What happened to Treasury after well, that it, afternoon of February 21st in terms of your formal uh, inquiry into the Solomon Brothers activity. Let me tell you what we knew and what we thought we had on our hands at that time. Uh, there was no evidence of any fraud or, or things of that nature at that time. What we had was two bids from entities named Warburg, and the question we, we were answering was, uh, are these two Warburg entities related parties for purposes of the 35 percent rule? Uh, whether or not they were, there was no violation of the 35 percent rule because there was a proration in the auction. Uh, however, we did conclude, and we said in our letter of April 17th, that they would be considered related parties. And we notified by letter both Warburgs, and we copied Solomon on that letter. And it, it is that letter which then, uh, according to the testimony of Mr. Buffett and other reports, led Mr. Moser to walk into Mr. Str Mr. Merriweather's office and... I understand that. We're, we're interested in, Mr. Powell, is what happened for the nearly two months between February 21st, when you were first notified of this uh, discrepancy, uh, anomaly, and uh, the letter that you wrote on April 17th. Walk us through step by step who Treasury was speaking to at uh, Solomon Brothers, what the level of uh, contact was. Did it, was it up to your level? Was it above your level? No. Who, in fact, was uh, proceeding uh, to, uh, to uh, ferret out the facts in a expeditious fashion and to ensure that, in fact, there had been no improper activity which had occurred surrounding the uh, 20, February 21st auction. At this point, what you have is a routine interpretation of a bidding rule which is conducted by the Bureau of the Public Debt, uh, which is part of the Treasury Department. And they uh, contacted the, uh, uh, both the Warburg, the primary dealer, which had entered the small bid, and Warburg Asset Management, on whose behalf Solomon had fraudulently entered a, a, a substantially larger bid for the 35 percent amount. Both those parties were contacted. 
They were permitted to supply information as to whether that bore on the question of whether they were or were not related parties. Well, who handled it for the Treasury then, Mr. Powell? Uh, uh, people in the Bureau of the Public Debt. So it was I can supply the names for the record if you'd like. So, yes, please. That would be very helpful. We'd like to know how high it went inside of uh, Treasury in terms of the attention which was paid to it. Uh, did, they, did you continue to uh, coordinate with the New York Fed or the Fed itself on this activity? We kept the Fed apprised, so yes. the Fed knew all along what was going on? Is that yes. correct, Mr. Corrigan, or Mr. Mullins? From February 21st through April 17th, were you... Uh, <coughs> We certainly knew what, right. what the Treasury was doing, but I think the comment that Mr. Powell has made is, is, is an appropriate one. At that point in time, uh, there was nothing to suggest the extraordinary developments which would subsequently be known. And it, it, it was a, the context uh, in that time frame was fairly narrow, but the, I think the important point is that however narrow it, it, it was, the fact that the thing was pursued, and indeed was pursued rigorously by the Treasury, clearly is what made Mr. Mosier fess up. I understand that, Mr. Cargan. I guess what I'm wondering is why it took two months to check the bids. Does it take that long in order to go through a procedure for a single day, two months? The, the, the checking of the bids took a half an hour. That was and it took you yet an additional two months then to, said. in fact, determine that there might be some I problem? Don't. What did Wahlberg say to you when you called him on February 22nd, I would assume, or, or later on the 21st? Well, their, what was their Their letter to says that they, they responded to our letter of uh, April 17th by saying thank you very no, much. No, but I'm we'll talking about February 21st now. On 20, February 21st, you have basically stated that you, you we, were concerned about this Warburg participation at this stage and that you assigned or some people within the Bureau of Debt or whatever it may be called inside of Treasury were, was then pursuing this question. Uh, what was the uh, correspondence. Do you have a copy of the? You, could you give us a record of the of the correspondence then between yourselves and Wahlberg during this period? I'll of time? be happy to if I can. Is there a, car, a, a, a correspondence? Yes, there is. There is. Did it begin on February 21st? Or how long did it take then after you identified this? The, the written correspondence that I've seen uh, begins with our letter of the of the 17th of April. The 17th, so nothing happened in writing between February 21st and April 17th between yourselves and Wahlberg. Nothing that I'm aware of in writing happened. Well, Mr. Cargan, was there anything from the Fed that went over to uh, Wahlberg, uh, from any people within your organization, uh, to uh, identify uh, uh, what might uh, be awry in terms of this Wahlberg bid? No. <clears throat> Nothing? Uh, no. But again, it, I don't know what happened at the Treasury. And, I, and this is, I think, is not. Well, this is the problem, as you can imagine. We're, we're beginning but to. Clearly, clearly something that. had to happen in order for Treasury to reach the determination it reached in the letter that it was a single firm for purposes of, of the bidding rules. And again, it, I think it's important to recognize When did that, that occur, though? What was the date upon which I, both the Fed and the Treasury agreed that there was a problem that would have triggered the letter? When did it reach your level, Mr. Corrigan? When did what? When did the uh, Warburg question come to your attention? Come to my The date, yes. It did not come to my personal attention until after the problem surfaced in May. In May? That's correct. That was the first time you knew about it? That's the first time I knew about the question that had arisen was sometime after the May two-year auction that produced the circumstances that Mr. Braden described. When, Mr. Powell, did you learn personally of the Warburg problem? No earlier than that. I believe in about the same time frame. So, uh, Mr. Mullins, did you learn anything earlier? No, that was about my, uh, the time that uh, uh, the board was also informed of this, became aware of this. So we've gone through a two-month period at this stage where neither, neither agency at this point has uh, flagged this issue to the point where it has uh, risen up to your own, your personal attention. Is that correct? Now, let me ask this. Why 
in your opinion, wasn't the SEC then brought in, at least at a lower level, uh, by your subordinates uh, to ensure that there was a full coordination uh, of any investigative uh, uh, effort in this area? They are, after all, the cop on the beat here. Uh, what was the well, procedure which the three agencies used to ensure that um, there was full coordination and the SEC was fully uh, involved right from the earliest stages? Let me say, when we believe that, that laws have been violated, we call the SEC right away. And that's what we did with what May 2 What is that date squeeze. again? We, what is the date, Mr. Powell, well, on we that? We called them about the two-year squeeze on May 29th. May 29th. But we did not at this time believe, as, there, there are two separate sets of allegations here. Mm -hmm. One is the, the uh, fraudulent bidding that took place in the February auction. There was no reason to believe, and indeed we did not believe, that fraud had taken place there. No one uh, at the Treasury or at the Fed at that time, as far as I know, uh, understood that there had been anything other than Well, a, you hadn't uh, checked the bids, though, had you? You were assuming that there was no problem, the bids on the day of the auction. without having put a procedure in place to check the bids, to look at the suspicious activity and to put at rest uh, in the minds of any of the participants out there in the marketplace that there was anything right. You had no procedure, in other words, in place amongst the various agencies to, in fact, to look at those bids as of February 21st and in the immediate af aftermath. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. The procedure was to contact the bidders and Solomon Brothers, and uh, that was done immediately upon the auction, and we were misled. Well, um, if Mr. Mosier did not, in fact, uh, have the bad luck of picking the wrong name, Warburg, would we know of any of this, Mr. Powell? Is there another mechanism by which we could find out? Yes, there is. And uh, since that time, uh, there's been a procedure instituted. No, I, I don't mean since that time. I mean at that time. Did, would you have had another way of, of uh, uh, that is, if, you had a, if he had a more willing uh, uh, conspirator at that time, would you have had any way of uh, going back and checking in a way that uh, would have ensured that uh, uh, there was real integrity in the marketplace? I mean, the rules that you were operating under at that time. I don't mean any changes you've made since then. Well, yes, I, I think uh, to the extent uh, violations of the 35% rule resulted in things like market squeezes, that would show itself immediately in, uh, in the pricing of the securities involved, and that would cause us to take the action we, we took on the May 2 I year. understand that, but again, you have this huge gap that's developed, even though you had a name and you had someone who clearly didn't know about it, it was, there was still a two-month period. When did you find out that there was a 35% violation, by the way? What was the date on that? August 9th. You found out about that on August 9th? When Solomon Brothers admitted to it. For the first time. Um, let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Breeden. When was the first time that you were contacted, if not in writing, then uh, uh, orally? Did you know before any, the written correspondence that uh, this uh, situation was uh, developing? If I can separate clearly, we were, <clears throat> we're talking about two different sets of events. We were contacted on May the 29th by the Treasury Department regarding their suspicions that illegal conduct had occurred in connection with the May 22nd notes. So I think very promptly upon uh, discovering that there was any uh, concern about the May 22nd auction, the Treasury called, and we then began an immediate process of coordination with them to begin uh, surveillance of the market and subsequently an investigation. Uh, we were not advised about the February events and the exchange of correspondence between uh, the Treasury and uh, Warburg, uh, the Warburg firm as to the legal connections uh, between Warburg's and Mercury Asset Management. Uh, we never received notice um, of that correspondence and that matter. Uh, and became aware of it only in uh, mid-August. So let me go back over to the Fed then. So that in the June letter uh, that you sent to the uh, uh, subcommittee, um, you could not identify uh, the May violation, which was 85 percent of the market which had been conned. Is that correct at that point in time, which you had uh, responded to the subcommittee in writing in June? You had as yet had uh, uh, all recognized in the time frame of uh, the letter you're referring to that there was this uh, apparent squeeze in in the marketplace uh, surrounding the two-year 
uh, main uh, issue. Um, at that time, uh, there was not evidence that the bidding rules as they pertain to the 35% in the May auction had been violated. What we knew at that time was that Solomon Brothers and two of its major clients had taken down you know, a very substantial fraction, 80 some odd percent as I recall, of the two-year note issue by submitting what was a very aggressive bid uh, and a bid uh, that took the rest of the market by surprise. In those circumstances, the Fed, the Treasury, and the SEC all began immediately uh, looking very closely at those developments. And the market was telling us a story. Uh, the, the interest rate uh, on that particular issue was out of line, and we immediately had this so-called special set of circumstances develop in the repo market. But at that point in time, there was no evidence of any irregularity as it pertained to the Treasury's 35 percent rule. Subsequently, two things happened that bore on the 35 percent rule. One was that uh, a discrepancy was discovered uh, by the Fed in terms of a box on the auction form relating to the position of the firm in the so-called when issued market, uh, which again was immediately discussed with the Treasury, with the Justice Department, with the SEC, but the final confirmation, admission if you will, of a violation of the 35 percent rule did not come until Solomon Brothers' second press release on Wednesday the 13th. But it's clear in these circumstances that what prompted both the first press release and the second press release is that this noose uh, in the form of these multiple investigations that were closing in on them was 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 biting. But you understand the problem now, Mr. Corrigan, okay, as you lay out the uh, scenario. Uh, here are the problems. First two months went by from February until April and <coughs> nothing happened. Solomon felt no heat until April 17th that, when in fact there had been I don't, a serious violation I of, don't a, think that of, that uh, even of the uh, I mean, trust I of, the, read, of the marketplace on that date. And then what happened between April read, 17th and May 22nd auction, nothing was done which may have prevented the May occurrence. And what you tell us is that until Solomon on August 9th releases information in a press release, uh, there's still no systematic a mechanism put in place in order to go back and to review all of these procedures uh, to ferret out the uh, the problem areas uh, at a much earlier time. Uh, and this is very troubling to us, as you can imagine. And the lack of coordination which exists here is uh, is very telling in terms of the uh, the need for us uh, to ensure that there is better coordination between all of the agencies and a telescoping of the time frame which uh, transpires in identifying and dealing with uh, problems which exist uh, in this very important, uh, it's been described by the witnesses here today, the most important uh, uh, marketplace in the world. Uh, there's just too much time that elapses and not enough coordination between the regulators. Let me, uh, uh, let me turn and recognize the uh, ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. You elicited to the question she has certainly points out the need for a better, more efficient regulatory structure, and I want to get into that uh, to a certain extent because while uh, Chairman Breeden has proposed some changes in the current law, 
I'm not at all sure that they're adequate to do the kind of job that should be done. Let me begin by asking a uh, different type of question, Mr. Corrigan. How important is maintaining the primary dealer system? And are the problems we're witnessing here and that have been discussed a problem of the primary dealer system or of the auction process? Well, again, I, I think the specific problem uh, that we're discussing here hopefully turns out to be an isolated one. And I think that's why it's so important that Mr. Braden and the law enforcement authorities go at this thing vigorously so we can satisfy ourselves as to whether or not that is the case. Uh, the primary dealer mechanism, I do not think, is in any way central to these issues in, in the following sense. Uh, first of all, Given the sheer size of the financing needs of the United States government, you will always have uh, a group of firms that are going to have to be, and will choose to be, the major market makers in U.S. government securities. The primary dealer thing really, in a sense, comes in the side door, as I tried to explain in my statement. The Federal Reserve conducts monetary policy primarily through open market operations. And that's not unique to the Federal Reserve. Now, if it's going to conduct open market operations, by definition, there has to be a private sector counterparty out there to be on the other side of those transactions. Now, from a straightforward business point of view, that means that the Fed incurs the same risks in credit terms and other terms than anybody else does. And it also means, as a practical matter, that you're going to have to limit, one way or another, the firms that you do business with. You just can't do business with everybody. The primary dealer designation uh, arose out of those historical facts. And for a long time, it was a less formal set of arrangements than it is now. But with the pressures of time and disclosure and all the rest of it, the list of primary dealers has become a very public thing. As I said, we've thought about it many times. Once very aggressively only two years ago. You know, is there a better mousetrap? The problem that we run into is, again, whether you call them primary dealers or not, there still will have to be a <coughs> class of institutions that we operate with in the marketplace. But I don't think that primary dealer designation or the apparatus in and of itself is directly related to the issues before the committee in the spirit, I think, of your question. Let me take it a step forward. One of the questions we're being asked to address, and I'm looking for remedies so that this problem doesn't occur again or can't occur again, is whether the SEC or Treasury Department should oversee the development of disclosure systems for information currently appearing only on the screens of primary dealers. Now, do you believe a system disclosing the quotes and other information appearing on the screens of primary dealers would be an improvement over the current system? I would welcome <coughs> developments that move in that direction, including uh, oh, I this just skip it? credible and acceptable systems that provide for greater electronic access to that type of information. Yes, sir. All right, now, couldn't the problem of the short squeeze, which has been discussed ad infinitum here, be eliminated if the Treasury discontinued the practice of announcing how big the auction will be and instead used a range to describe its size? I. 
I doubt it, uh, but I think that uh, well, I, the Treasury should speak to that, but I would think that that would potentially severely complicate their debt management problems, and indeed it could introduce even greater elements of volatility into this marketplace. The marketplace functions in part uh, with the great efficiency that it does because there is uh, a large degree of transparency, especially as it pertains to the flow of new issues into the market. Uh, what I'm talking about, in effect, is accepting some risk in the market in order to get rid of the short squeeze. And apparently, what your your response disagrees to a certain extent with what Mr. Buffett said, well, because he ways. said, in effect, that if demand was great, the Treasury could sell more securities. Well, he I testified see. a little while ago, in fact, that the answer to a short squeeze is more supply. Now, well, that's a different that's a different observation. First thing you said was that you keep the market in the dark as to what you're going to issue. Well, a small you range. The second question is: Is one way to deal with a squeeze to reopen the issue and sell more securities? The answer to that is clearly yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me go go over to uh, Mr. Breeden for a minute, if I have a little more time. Uh, in your uh, prepared testimony on page 12, you stated that over the next 90 days, the Commission intends to re-examine the government securities market in close cooperation with the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Board. Such a review will likely encompass an analysis of the respective roles and legal authority of the three agencies in the government securities market as well as the need for additional rules of conduct and or legislative authority with respect to trading in government securities. Now, you go on to say that the SEC wants legislation to make, and I'm just going to summarize this in the interest of time, to make submitting false bids a specific securities law violation. You want to have the NASD authorized to adopt sales practice rules and increase the disclosure of dealer quotes, prices, and volume. Now, what I would like to ask is, how do the other panelists feel about this? Uh, you also added that you said it's premature, but some of the other panelists have said legislation is premature, I should say, but apparently you disagree. I want to find out whether or not uh, there are other legislative proposals, whether or not this is it, whether or not you need more time, how much time, and if so, how do panelists feel about a bill providing for a temporary extension of Treasury's rulemaking authority for a period of uh, 30 days, 60 days, or longer? Mr. Rinaldo, if I can just clarify, I think that uh, all the agencies, and I'll certainly let you poll the panel here, but I think we all agree that as to uh, what legislative changes are appropriate to the auction process and stemming out of the so-called Solomon case that it would be appropriate to wait until we know what the facts are and ultimately what did happen before we try and reach a judgment on what broad legislative changes, if any, are needed. And I believe our view on that subject is the same as the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, that we should wait until we know what the facts are before we try and craft a legislative response to the broader problem. And in the interim, we should not let the current Treasury rulemaking authority expire, but rather should uh, extend the sunset date of October 1st for a period of uh, three months uh, or whatever time period uh, the Congress would deem appropriate while the three agencies are working together to study these issues. The three specific uh, well, recommendations... Excuse me. The problem is, and I think you recognize it, we extended three months. You're talking probably a period of time when Congress will then adjourn. So you're talking well into next year. We probably won't be in session in December and January. So what you're saying, in effect, is that nothing will really get done till uh, the spring of next year. Am I uh, responding correctly to your statement? In other words, if you, res if you wait till this Congress adjourns and assume we adjourn sometime in November, we're never going to make a target date of October. It hasn't been done for the past 20 years. It's not going to be done now. So. We, we uh, adjourn in November sometime or even in early December. We won't have a bill in place then under your scenario. We won't be able to pass legislation, conference it, and get it over to the White House. 
So in effect, you're saying wait until uh, late January or February when Congress comes back. Is that an accurate assessment of what you're telling us? I was uh, trying to suggest you that you have two options. One, you can postpone the sunset date, keep the current statute in place until the agencies have given you an analysis and a proposal of what broader things could be done. Alternatively, you might elect to go forward uh, with reauthorizing permanently the Government Securities Act and fix at least some of the problems that we already know about and come back to the question of whether there are other changes that need to be made in the auction process. And clearly, uh, we have testified before, long before the Solomon matter came up, and have written to the Congress and worked with this uh, committee, as well as on the Senate side, to identify things we think are already broken with the Government Securities Act and, Act and need to be fixed. And that was the point of pointing out those three items of saying, if you choose to go ahead with a permanent reauthorization, then at a minimum you ought to include these three items. You may prefer, and, and we would not disagree with the judgment that you should defer, the entire project until we've had a chance to complete our study of what happened in this matter. Uh, I think the chairman is telling me my time has expired, but if I may indulge the chair, could we just ask the other regulators how they feel about an extension of time? Very briefly. All right. I could just say, speaking to the Board of Governors, that uh, we feel that adequate time is needed to assess carefully these changes, and I would be concerned about a short three months extension because I believe if we're going to fix it right, we need time for Congress to consider it and for hearings. So I think uh, we would uh, be of the view that uh, next year would be appropriate for major changes. A lot of things can be done by sharpening uh, surveillance and enforcement practices within the current system. Anyone else? For the Treasury. Uh, would agree with that. I, I think it's important that our rulemaking authority under the Government Securities Act not be allowed to expire, so there needs to be probably an extension. I think if Congress wants to come back and take more comprehensive legislative action early in 1992, that's certainly extraordinarily prompt and, uh, you know, not, not uh, in any sense a delay. Right. I want to time. thank the Chairman, and I think, Mr. Chairman, that what they're pointing out is that in their view we need a six-month extension. Gentlemen's uh, time has uh, expired. Uh, let me just note here that uh, uh, this subcommittee's definition of promptness and the witnesses here today is completely different. And uh, uh, the way in which this has been responded to from a regulatory uh, perspective is unacceptable. Uh, the rules which are on the books are clearly unacceptable. They're not working. Uh, we need an overhaul of um, all of these uh, procedures. As you well know, if, uh, if we go past this year, the way the legislative process works is that we'll probably be back here this time next year uh, considering legislation. Uh, this area cannot wait that long. Uh, we have to be able to move and move in an expeditious fashion. And by the way, it's not lost on this subcommittee that we take a legislative note at the way in which uh, the market reform package was handled. Uh, after the Brady Commission report came back in January of 1988, uh, by the way, something that only took six weeks and was comprehensive and basically the recommendation subscri subscribed to by the members of this subcommittee. We were then told that we should wait an additional four months while the Gould Group, uh, the Treasury, the Fed, the CFTC and the SEC studied it for yet an additional four months. And basically with David Reuter in dissent, uh, the group came back saying, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, we don't having studied this marketplace now since last September, having been told over and over again from many of the people at this table that there is no problem, um, we believe that uh, we've been uh, sufficiently attentive to the issue that we can move forward on mandatory firm procedures, large trading, customer reporting, uh, dealing with uh, uh, how a government uh, can ensure that this information gets into the hands of the, uh, of the uh, investors. Now, if you want to put together a set of recommendations on top of that that next year we could pass, send them up when you get done with the IRS sets of recommendations. But my own feeling is that what you'll be telling us on these areas is don't do it. And we don't want to have to wait six months for you to tell us that we shouldn't do anything. So why don't you take these recommendations which we've got on the table right now and give us over the short term your sense of whether or not they make any sense or not. And if you want to refine them and hone them, uh, we think they go at least 90 percent of the way towards uh, dealing with the problems in this marketplace. Anything else you want to add on, uh, we'll be more than willing to consider. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to sort of follow your 
uh, line of argument. I think we're all concerned that before this committee or any other committee acts to enhance the power of the uh, regulators, we need to be better convinced than we are that the regulators have utilized all of the authority they current ha currently have. Now, Chairman <coughs> Breeden, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> why did the SEC wait until August to subpoena market participants about their trading activities when by that time the Commission knew of the potential questionable activities back in May? Was there a communications breakdown in the regulatory process? Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Schor, there was not. In fact, uh, the Commission's uh, conduct of the investigation that has proceeded uh, uh, to date has been uh, exceptionally vigorous. I believe that uh, by any standard of our own or other agency investigations that we got on top of this, we got on top of it very quickly. We're in the process in a period of uh, a few weeks and, and months of examining a $2 trillion market and the practices of literally uh, dozens of market participants. Uh, we had submitted uh, formal requests for information, uh, which um, are, as I indicated, detailed letters specifying uh, documentation uh, that would be required to Solomon and a number of its customers uh, within less than a month uh, following the May 22nd auction, less than a month uh, following our learning of the uh, problem. Uh, that was uh, about three weeks or two weeks later than probably would have occurred, uh, but for the fact that we made a judgment that we might be more likely to be able to prove a case of collusion if we let the people we suspected of colluding go ahead and continue their activities a little bit longer while we were watching, taking pictures and trying to compile evidence of their behavior. What I think you're misperceiving uh, from our statement is the fact that we did not send formal subpoenas uh, until August. The difference between the letters we sent out and a subpoena is actually quite minimal in terms of a letter to a registered broker-dealer. We, in fact, have the lawful authority to seize their records and send examiners in and cart them off on a truck. And regulated broker-dealers understand that. And when they get a letter from us saying we need the following information, it is provided. Uh, we don't, uh, we decided not to send waves of subpoenas to everybody in the entire market because at that stage, because we were focused on Solomon and its customers, and in these matters there is often considerable advantage to targeting uh, particular uh, uh, actors in an investigation and sequencing the requests that you put out. But we responded extremely vigorously, and, and I don't believe that I'm happy to share with the committee and its staff the record of uh, how and when we acted. Uh, well, I personally was reviewing our plans for an investigation within 48 hours of our becoming aware that this situation even existed and our reaction has been very Perhaps there's been a lack of interagency communication. Uh, for example, the New York Fed regulates the auction, monitors the auction. The Treasury has rulemaking authority and your SEC uh, meets out punishment. Is it possible to improve communication and coordination between these bodies rather than tinkering with new regulations? I'm, I'm trying to make this whole process more lean and mean and perhaps defer new regulations until we can decide that the, the system that we have now can't be tightened up and made more efficacious. I'm sure that we can do better in communicating with one another, and I'm sure that that will be inevitably one of the results of this uh, situation. I would not want to leave the committee with the impression, however, that there has been a lack of uh, coordination. The Treasury called the SEC virtually immediately upon uh, uh, perceiving that there was a problem with the May auction. The Federal Reserve called the SEC virtually immediately upon yeah. discovering some of the documentation problems uh, that uh, came to light when they reviewed their files. So I can't, uh, at least as to the May auction and the process of investigating those events, I think there has been a very close cooperation. We, well, as I indicated, say, we didn't become aware of the February activities uh, at that time, but I think 
I think that's a different matter because I don't believe that either the Treasury or the Fed perceived that to be evidence of a crime or else that, had they, they would have called us. I think you probably adduced that there's a widespread feeling up here that there has been an inadequate coordination and cooperation uh, between the uh, federal agencies and Bob. Let me ask, do the regulatory bodies, all of you at that uh, table, do you have enough staff to provide the adequate oversight and surveillance and continuing in-depth scrutiny that's required in this marketplace? For example, does the New York Fed have enough staff to monitor a government securities auction? If, if the expectation of this committee or the treasurer of the SEC is that the Federal Reserve should get into the compliance business in earnest, which is not our mandate. That's not your mission, but I think it is your saying, mission if, to cooperate with the other agencies that do have a compliance about, responsibility. We can fulfill our responsibilities as they exist right now with our existing staff, but if we really had to get into the compliance and enforcement business, that would be a different ballgame. Uh, I don't personally think it's necessary for us to get into the compliance and enforcement business, nor do I even think it's desirable. Um, but that would be a different ballgame. Well, Mr. Mullins, you told us before that there appears to be no economically meaningful loss of confidence in, in this market, okay? And uh, I take it you base this assessment on the smooth functioning of the market in recent months. However, I think that all of us must agree that the Solomon scandal, when viewed in conjunction with other financial scandals of recent vintage, and I'm talking about Ivan Bosky, I'm talking about Michael Milliken, I'm talking about Charles Keating, and now uh, the Solomon uh, situation, I think that this consumer c confidence that is so necessary to our ability to finance America and, f and finance our a uh, $3.7 billion dollar na uh, trillion dollar national debt. This, could, this confidence bubble could be a bubble that's ready to break, to bust. And then we have a desperately uh, troublesome situation in financing America's needs. So I think that undergirds all of our concern about bringing this situation to a final halt, making sure that there are never any abuses of this kind again. We're up to four or five and that's too much. And I would agree with you, uh, uh, Congressman. That's why it's important to do, uh, to, to assess the changes carefully in a deliberative process and, and get it right. And also not to overreact and not to lay on more regulation that is, uh, in terms of a sharp, cost-effective analysis, uh, necessary to do the job that we're talking about. I agree. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Slatter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for the record, um, Mr. Powell, um, the Bureau of Public Debt, is that uh, your responsibility? They don't report through me, no. They actually report to another assistant secretary who reports to Bob Glauber. Who, um, who is the other assistant secretary that they report to? There's a career assistant secretary named Jerry Murphy who is the fiscal assistant secretary, and they report directly to him. Um, Jerry Murphy. So Jerry he, Murphy, and he reports to, to uh, Undersecretary Glauber. Mm -hmm. I but, share with Mr. Glauber, though, and others, responsibility for Treasury debt management, and I interact regularly with public debt. Well then, who does who is responsible? Is what I'm asking for the operation of pure of public debt. Is it you or is it Mr. Glauber? Well, the the commissioner of the public debt is in the first case responsible. I understand, but who does he report to? Uh, he reports ultimately to to, uh, to Jerry Murphy. Jerry um, Murphy, and then yeah. who does Jerry Murphy report to? Glauber, who reports to the secretary. I see. So you're not in the in the chain of command. Is that what you're telling us? Uh, technically speaking, I'm not. No. Technically speaking, as a matter of practice, are you in the chain of command? Or? As a matter of practice, uh, we are responsible for policy in this area. And uh, We? Who does that mean? D domestic finance, 
Um, is that you? That's me. Okay. I, I just, the reason I'm asking the questions, I mean, I like to put faces and names together and so I understand who, who's who out there and we don't have a program, you know, and we need one sometimes. Um, I, I want to go back, if I can, to, to the um, February uh, auction and I want you to explain to me, if you can, um, really what happened after this February auction and after uh, it became clear that you were dealing with with several Warburgs, okay? You know, I find this um, almost incredible that, that there would be a mistake, quote, made uh, in who the buyer was. You know, and apparently, some, from what we've been told, when uh, Solomon was contacted, and you know, I guess you contacted Mosier, someone did, they were told by Mosier that uh, a mistake was made that it really wasn't uh, Warburg, it was supposed to be, what was the? Mercury, Mercury Asset Assets. Management, which is yeah, that's a, a subsidiary that's, of Warburg. Yeah, I understand, but I mean, that's a little bit like a high-powered lawyer, you know, getting the wrong name on, on a contract, is it not? The name of the firm had, had formerly been Warburg Asset Management, but it's a, it's a mistake. And, and tell me then what happened after, after this mistake was learned about. I'd like to know what happened. Who was personally responsible in, in your department for, for following up on this? And tell me what happened. Okay. The, I mean, uh, you learned that somebody had made a big mistake. I mean, well, here's the a guy, we're not auction. talking about a few hundred dollars. We're talking about somebody coming in with a multi-billion dollar offer to buy securities. And the wrong name is on the contract. Or somebody tells you, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened, what, what effort was made, by whom, to follow up on that. Okay. The, the day of the auction, immediately upon receiving the bids at about 1 o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, the Fed, in its routine uh, surveillance of the 35% rule. Fed, that means Mr. Corrigan. Right. That's right. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Noticed that there was a We're going to personalize this conversation a right. little bit here, okay? <laughs> uh, noticed that there was a, uh, a bid from a primary dealer, S.G. Warburg, in the amount of, in a small amount, and that there was a quite large bid in the full amount of 35% of the auction from someone called okay, Warburg Asset Management. Who discovered that? An employee of the New York Fed. Okay, now, how did your department get involved in this? Uh, they telephone us and ask us for an interp. See, we write the rules. I understand. So they telephone so us and ask Mr. us Corrigan for. Mr. Corrigan caught this. Said there's several Cor there's several Warburgs here. Check it out. Only one Corrigan. Pardon me. <laughs> I said there's only one Corrigan. Okay. Now, uh, now who did he call in your office? He called someone in the Bureau of the Public Debt. I, no. I, as I said to Mr. Mark, I'd be happy to supply the names of the people who made the who got the actual know. phone call. You don't know who in your department was contacted. I don't know the name of the individual. I know it's uh, one of a handful of people. Have you discussed this matter with this individual? With that individual. I've discussed it with, uh, no, I haven't discussed it with the guy who took the phone call, no. Did we know what happened, though. I mean, we. But you haven't called him into your office and said, tell me what happened? I haven't, no. Mike Basham did that. Mike Basham now. Now, Mike Basham has left, right? That's right. He's been replaced. Pardon me? He has been replaced. He has been replaced. Was not, Mike he, Basham? Let me clarify. He, he departed. and. His replacement has begun at the Treasury. He's not expired, but no. he has departed. Is that correct? Doing well, as far as I know. Okay. He's doing well. Okay. Let, let, me, then, let me then follow up. So he calls uh, your man, who we don't know who that was, a, a faceless person in your department, who reports to Mr. Basham. Is that correct? No. He reports. This is a gentleman who worked in the Bureau of the Public Debt. I understand. Who reports to the Commissioner mm -hmm. of the Public Debt. Who okay. Who reports, is the Commissioner again of Public Debt? A fellow named Greg. Greg, yeah. have you talked to Mr. Greg about this problem? Uh, about this problem? I've yes. talked to him about the general matter we're talking about here. I, I don't know. But you haven't talked to him specifically about this contact. I mean, this about is the this key phone contact. Call? Yes. No. You haven't talked to him about that? No, I haven't. But okay. Mr. Basham did. Mr. Basham did. Yeah. Who worked and you haven't any time since then bothered to go back and contact these people and find out specifically what happened? You know, I, Mr. Basham's job was to go back and, and determine the facts. He did that. I didn't redo the job for him. We thought he had done it correctly. Okay. Well, go ahead and, and tell me what, what uh, so, so there was a contact with, with the, the Bureau of Debt. 
Okay. And, uh, and you knew there was a problem out here. A mistake had been made in a, in a multi-billion dollar purchase agreement. And uh, go ahead and tell me what happened. Well, the that. representative, I believe, of the New York Fed contacted Solomon and said, you submitted a customer bid on behalf of uh, Warburg Asset Management. But when you say Solomon, you mean Mosier. Uh, I believe it was uh, Murphy, actually, not Moser, who was contacted. But that was, I, I defer. Uh, yeah, sure. so, so you, Murphy worked for Mosier. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Go ahead, then. And uh, Murphy, I guess, or someone said, uh, we'll call you right back, called back and said, it's really Mercury Asset Management, not Warburg Asset Management. That's who it is. And it's a 75% owned subsidiary, uh, or it's, it's more remote in the corporate structure, and it really shouldn't be considered, like, you know, over time they developed the argument that it really shouldn't be considered a related party. And did they anybody then called, check up on that? Well, they then, yes, they then called, uh, uh, having established those facts, or apparent facts, uh, asked us for a ruling, Treasury for a ruling, on, on the two bids, and are they a related party? We determined that they, that to allow both bids to go into the auction because there wouldn't have been a violation of the 35 percent rule uh, if they had been accepted given what the proration factor turned out to be. So uh, for that, for purposes of that auction, it turned out not to matter, uh, you know, assuming again that we hadn't been lied to. Um, at that point, uh, we were, uh, we, had, we, we decided to make a formal ruling as to the, as to the relationship between these two parties for purposes of future auctions contacted members of, uh, of S.G. Warburg and Solomon Brothers and ascertained that, you know, the facts that related to whether they were or were not related parties and issued such a ruling in our letter of uh, the 17th of April. Then, did you check on the bid then at all? I mean, that was the end of the discussion. I mean, you called up the people that had made a terrible mistake and just having the wrong name on, well, a, on a multi-billion dollar purchase agreement and what you're telling me basically is you called up uh, Mosier and Murphy and and, the, the and Warburg and Warburg. Pardon me. And Warburg. We had contact with Warburg. Okay. And 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 basically took their word for what was going on. I mean, isn't that really what you did? Fundamentally, that is what we did. Yeah. You know, th this is this is a, a great concern to me because the, the, you know earlier the, today we heard Mr. Buffett sit at this table and tell us that that what happened in at the May auction was so incredible that it was almost like a death wish, I think, is, is the term that Mr. Buffett used. Which leads me to, to raise the question, if they had not made such an incredibly stupid, greedy play at the May auction, would you ever have been able to catch these people? Would the system that we have in place, that's based on honor, by the way, and I have some more questions about honor, in a minute, but you, you base this whole system on basically trust me and the honor system. I mean, you just admitted that. I mean, basically what no. you said was you took their word for it and you moved on down the road. And uh, I, I don't think that's a fair characterization of the way the entire system works. I was answering a, a, a narrow question. I think that mm -hmm. anyone who thought they could consistently throw in bids in the name of, uh, of a name like Warburg, which does apply to a primary dealer, and get away with it, and then go ahead and suppress confirms, therefore having to, you know, uh, conspire with other people. Anybody, anyone who thought they could get away with that over a substantial period of time had a death wish. Yeah. And uh, just as let, much as the May auction. Let, let me, uh, yeah. one point. Mr. Powell, if they had picked another name other than Warburg so that the two names identical did not show up in the same bid, would you have caught them? If there hadn't been uh, unusual market activity after the fact and they hadn't uh, in that one auction uh, used the same names then we might not have caught them. I thank my colleague. So basically what you just told us is that you would have never have caught a fraudulent bid unless it was such an outrageously greedy play like they well, did in May then you, you caught know, that. It's, bid. it's sort of hypothetical the fact is we did catch it and that's why we're sitting here. Well, the fact is you didn't really catch it until, you know. They fumbled the ball. You recovered the fumble. They fumbled the ball in May. You recovered the ball in August. And that and ball why did they make the around. Why did they fumble? But they did fumble. I understand they, that. They were hit. But, That's but, why they fumbled. But systems yeah. that only protect us. They didn't just fumble an open field. 
but systems yeah. that protect us only from honest people don't do any good. And I think that's what my colleague and I are trying to get trying to get to. Yeah, I, I guess my concern is is that I mean there was a little bit of fraud going on here that was not caught, and uh, even though it was multi-billion-dollar transactions. And then you had the situation in May where it was just incredible. As, as Mr. Buffett said, he couldn't believe that somebody would be so stupid as to do something like this. And it was so incredible as to be almost a death wish. Now, that's really what you caught. And then you caught that in August. OK, and I guess our question is, absent such an incredibly stupid play as they involved in in May, would you have been able to catch them? And I guess basically your, question, your answer to that is maybe so, maybe not. Well, but uh, let's move on to something else. Uh, I'm concerned about this Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee that uh, I've been reading about. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, it's got 18 members. Something mm -hmm. over half of them are primary dealers. Something less than half are uh, not primary dealers and are, mm -hmm. are customers, money managers of that uh, nature. Now, they, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Solomon Brothers had a representative on the That's advisory correct. committee, right? That's correct. Okay, who was that? Dale Horowitz, who's also president of the SIA. Okay. Um, the, the function of that committee is to advise the Treasury on debt management issues. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very valuable to us to be able to get in one room a collection of people who are knowledgeable across a broad range of financial and economic issues and draw on their expertise on a regular basis within defined circumstances with appropriate safeguards and all that. Now, these um, people meet uh, prior to an auction with the uh, undersecretary, in this case, Mr. Glauber. Is that correct? And I mean, myself and others. And, and others. Yeah. And what you all do is talk about conditions in the marketplace. Is that correct? I'll take, take you through the whole thing. They, okay. they come down four times a year, mm -hmm. immediately prior to the announcement of the major quarterly auctions. Immediately so, prior to the announcement of the major, of the major quarterly, quarterly refunding auctions, okay. which are threes, tens, and 30-year mm -hmm. securities. Uh, they come down on a Tuesday morning, and from the time they get there on Tuesday morning until the time they leave, they're uh, not supposed to have any contact at all with their firm. Uh, these, are the, these are some of the folks that, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, they are told on Tuesday morning uh, where they're given a charge, and that charge is to make a recommendation as to the Treasury's financing plans for the coming quarter. And that, that's what we're there to ask mm -hmm. them to do, and we tell them, uh, what our cash needs are going to be, uh, and they, they, they are charged to go ahead and make that uh, recommendation. Now, before the, long before they ever so get down there. you tell them how much borrowing you really have to do at this quarterly auction? Well, they, basically they already know, because long before they get on a plane to come down to Washington or from, from wherever they are, mm -hmm. uh, there are stories uh, written and they come across my Tellerate machine regularly that, that say, here's what Treasury is going to do, and, and they, people, other people, private sector people, sample the dealer community, follow our cash position very carefully. So there's an awful lot of predictability deliberately built into the system. No surprises, broad understanding of our cash needs and our financing plans. We have them down, and we say, what's your recommendation? Uh, typically, uh, what size should the three-year, 10-year, and 30-year bills be? What other auction should we conduct? It's all extremely routinized, by the way. They all take place on a, a schedule that's um, predictable and, and well understood in the marketplace. Um, we well, have dinner with them. Wouldn't this information be very valuable to the people back at the home office, back at the companies? If it differed from, in any substantial way, from uh, what the market already understood to be the case, then it would be, th there would be ways you could exploit it for your own value. However, it typically doesn't because uh, we are so carefully watched uh, and there is so much publicly available information about the Treasury by design that there isn't anything real shocking that we tell them when they come down on Tuesday morning. It's all fairly... Uh, Prices discussed? No. Pricing is not... The market sets pricing in the Treasury market. That, what, what's, so you what's, never discuss prices? No, you don't. It, it's not about pricing. It's about what's, what's demand in the long end of the market, what's demand in the short end. Um, you don't typically uh, talk about what price, because th that'll happen two weeks later when you come to market, and it'll come at the market price. Do you discuss interest rates? 
Um, as a general matter, people uh, discuss you know, the state of the economy, recent economic news. Is there any informal speculation about what interest rates might be? About what actions the Fed might take, or what action? Yes. No, about what the what uh, kind what of interest rates you're looking rates? at with um, the sale. Yes, well, people will speculate. Not, I mean, speculate is kind of a loaded term, but people will uh, mm -hmm. discuss, hopefully intelligently, the the probable future direction of interest rates as a as a general mm -hmm. matter. Yes. Will they then talk about and speculate about what prices you might um, have to be dealing with with the not not not, not really. It may sound odd, but you're. The, those rates securities will be price, brought, right? but they'll be brought to, to the market, and the market will determine the price. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, if there's a 30-year, if there's a curve, you can look there and see what the price, what the interest rate's going to be when you bring it to market. The well, real talk question about is likely the, demand in the market. Yes, yeah. That, that's the the real question. As I was starting to say, is what's the depth of demand in the particular maturity categories, uh, and should we? Do more at the long end. Is there a lot of appetite out there because of expectations about interest rates at the long end of the market, at the short end of the market, in the middle of the market? Well, won't basic economics coupled with demand coupled with interest rate pretty much determine price? Yes, it will. So it would seem to me that these people participating in this type of meeting would have very valuable information. Would, would you agree? As I said before, if the information they got about our, the information they have at this time mm -hmm. is uh, the Treasury's cash needs for the coming quarter. If that information did differ in a material way from what was in the public domain, then yes, there would be, there's, there is the possibility to go out and break the law, although it's, it's difficult because there's no when issued trading in the securities. Now, um, these people that participate in this meeting, they are advised not to contact, as you said, their offices. Is that correct? That's right. I, I want assume to stress the reason you have that rule in place is because you don't want them to share information yeah. that they learn at this meeting with the people back in the well, that's right. office. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, it would just seem to me that, that we have set in, we have here in place a system, a meeting that goes on that by your own admission provides certain key players in the industry with very valuable information that's not otherwise publicly uh, available. And the only protection that we're relying upon is the honor system again. Well, the honor, the commitment that these people have made to you that they're not going to go back to their hotel room that night and pick up the phone and call, call their buddy in the, in the trading room. There, there are really multiple safeguards in place. It's not just uh, well, I mean, the blackout. My, my, isn't my characterization pretty fair, though? I mean, you're relying upon their, the honor system, basically, and that is that they won't go back to their hotel room and call some friend in the company. I guess I wonder what the alternative is. Are we going to tail these people? Pardon me? We, no, I mean, I, I'm raising questions, and I'm leading to the point as to why we have this, this sort of advisory committee. I, the reason we have it is that it, it is a, a real benefit to the Treasury Department to, uh, you know, we do have an awful lot of these securities to sell, and uh, we, we need to be uh, apprised of uh, whatever the marketplace is thinking and doing out there on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. We think that the way it's done is, in fact, a, you know, it's better to do it in an organized forum where there are Treasury representatives present at all times while they're meeting so that the possibility of collusion is, is minimized. And, um, you know, it's see, all we've, done we've created public notice. Okay. I am going to end here in just a second. I want to hear Mr. Breeden's comment while they're <coughs> changing the paper. You ready? Awful fast, aren't you? Yeah. Um, see, my concern is a very simple one, and that is you, you have in place here a, a, a system from the outside looking in, candidly, looks rather incestuous. Uh, you have a situation where all the, all the Wall Street crowd comes down and, and meets with you, and you chat about uh, interest rates, you chat about overall economics, you chat about different assumptions people are making, you generally share, share very valuable information from theoretically some of the most knowledgeable people in the country, and uh, you have this collective sort of wisdom about what's going to happen, and you all agree that you're not going to go back and call any of your friends in the business to share with them the information that you've just discussed. And, you know, if there's one thing that this member of Congress has learned in the last few years, and that is we shouldn't be in the business of trusting uh, people to that extent. 
and you know we, we trusted uh, some folks at Solomon Brothers you all did and they 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 uh, you know they betrayed your trust and we you know our trust has been betrayed on many occasions and all I'm suggesting is is that maybe we ought to change the system and act more like cops and be more critical in these kind of situations instead of having an attitude of uh, trust and and, uh, and and a sort of a benign regulatory friendship that 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 exists and uh, I, that's my observation and I'd, I'd like to hear Mr. Breeden's uh, you know view from a regulatory perspective as to you know what's going on here and is it a good idea to continue this sort of thing and I want to hear from Mr. Corrigan and also from Mr. Mullins on the question of whether we should continue this this uh, the Treasury Advisory uh, Committee. Mr. Breeden. Uh, Congressman, I, I really would, um, I would note that um, the SEC has advisory committees on various issues. Uh, the Federal Reserve has a large number of advisory committees. But, uh, uh, let, me, let me just interject. I mean, the SEC is not in a position where you're going to, they're advising you on information that they could theoretically go back and use to, uh, to take advantage of the marketplace, are they? That's correct. I mean, they're uh, the, talking our advisory to committees are okay. general in nature. Uh, and the same is true really of the Federal Reserve probably, but we'll hear from Mr. Corgan in a minute. But, is it a good idea to have this kind of a committee in operation given the cloud that's over the industry right now and, and the perception that this creates? Yes or no? I'd really defer to the Treasury's judgment on that. It is a question of whether the benefits are significant enough to be worth, worth the risk of the perception that somebody's got a cozy, better uh, source of information. And I can't evaluate mm -hmm. and would defer to the Treasury's judgment as to uh, their okay. feeling that they do obtain valuable information mm -hmm. from this process. Okay. Mr. Corgan? I have to admit, Congressman, and probably at the risk of disenfranchising myself a little bit, that I have Appreciate your not, willingness to take the risk. I have not, or I should put it this way, I've been uneasy, to be very honest, about that particular mechanism for some time. You pardon me? You've been very I uneasy? I have been uneasy about that mechanism for some time. Uh, having said that, can I just pick up on a question you raised before that I... Sir, let me hear from Mr. Mullins first and I'll come back. Okay, okay. Mr. Mullins? I would agree with uh, Chairman Breeden that uh, Treasury really needs to assess the value they receive and uh, I believe that they probably receive substantial value out of this mm -hmm. and the potential for uh, in the predictable uh, uh, circumstances system they've designed, the potential for abuse is, uh, is relatively minor, but it's really their judgment on whether they okay. need that sort of expertise. And it's your judgment that really the system is okay, that we don't really need to do much. And well, no, I, it is my judgment that a lot could be done in general to sharpen the surveillance and enforcement systems within the current uh, structure, and then I think it would be... By who? Uh, well, I think all the agencies involved, I think it then would be visible when someone... But you didn't have any specific recommendations from the Fed. Well, I think, the, uh, I think there are some uh, steps that uh, have been taken. Uh, what? Uh, spot checking of customer I would uh, hope that was bids, already going on. Uh, things of that nature. And I think generally uh, an Spot checking the customers of the billion dollar buyers is uh, what you're telling me, right? Calling them up and finding out. Uh, Anything else? Uh, well, I think in general there's an attitude of uh, analyzing the market and the uh, data that but we get. But you don't get. have any specific statutory changes that you think should be enacted? Well, the, the statutory change that was, uh, I think we would generally support the ones that Chairman Breeden mentioned. I do think it's worth, we may come back with more, but I think those should be done in the context of possible changes in the structure of the auction uh, uh, and the broader changes. But nothing is needed immediately. Really. I think what's needed immediately is closer attention to uh, monitoring uh, and, and enforcement, and okay. I think... Uh, Just sort of generally, sort of keep on the current system, but try to do it a little better, is I what think, you're saying. I think we've uh, improved okay. the... Mr. Uh, Corgan? Process. Go ahead and comment on what you were going to comment on earlier. I, I just wanted to come back to the question that you were raising is, you know, would these guys have gotten caught if they hadn't gotten so greedy? Yeah, a little, my, they were getting by with a little draft and they my, got... My conviction is they would have gotten caught even if they hadn't gotten that greedy. Because... Who would have caught them? Would you would have caught them, Mr. Corrigan? I think there's a pretty good chance. 
pretty I good chance you would have. I <laughs> think they would have tripped themselves up on something else or else some of the things that had already been done would have ultimately percolated up one way or another. <laughs> now, having said that, uh, I think it's also fair to say, even in the context of your colloquy with Governor Mullins a moment ago, and some of the things that Mr. Breeden says, when I think, speaking just for myself, when we are, at least, again, speak for myself, I am saying that I think that you can do things within existing law. Uh, you know, just as an example, there's been an impression created that nothing, or little, more than nothing has been done or is being done in terms of trying to apply higher technology to this process, including the bidding process. And I don't want to leave the impression that I think higher technology is a panacea, but the fact of the matter is uh, that there are two major projects, uh, one that hopefully will be finished sometime next year that will represent a huge step forward in the way the so-called non-competitive bidding process in Treasury auctions works, and another one uh, that was started right around the turn of this year that would provide an automated system for the processing of the competitive bids from persons other than primary dealers. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Those types of things can build in elements of controls, checks and balances, edits and things that are superior to what's in place right now. So all I'm trying to suggest is I don't think it's fair to construe certainly what I'm saying. I think the others are saying is that we're sitting here saying everything is fine. What I'm trying to say, and I think what we're all trying to say, is we are deeply concerned about these developments. Yes. Deeply concerned. Let me ask you something. What would be wrong with having, maybe you have this kind of situation in place, what would be wrong with having some kind of a pre-approval of buyers in these auctions? so that you wouldn't get into this situation of trying to find out who Mercury Assets is and who it's owned by and, you know, I mean... Well, to some extent... I mean, not everybody can go in and bid on these multi-billion dollar auctions. And is there a way to do that? Just have a list of, of approved bidders. Well, to some extent, we rely on something that's fairly close to that right now. But uh, if you had a list, First of all, these mutual funds proliferate and multiply like rabbits. So I don't think that would fully solve the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. But on top of that, uh, I can just so see are the they primary dealers uh, of some fella comes along who's got some small operation in a garage out in Long Island or wherever and says, I'm not on that list. I'm being discriminated against. So I'm not sure I'm ready to buy the list idea, okay. but I think I would say that I think there are some things in the technological area that can make a big difference here, and both for the competitive and non-competitive bidding processes, the Treasury and the Fed do have major projects underway right now. Okay, I'd, I would like you to submit in detail the kind of information that you have that would I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Sir. Yeah. That, I mean, I think if you set up a list of uh, bidders rather than leaving it more open-ended as, as it is, uh, you'd still have the same, you could still have the same problem that happened here as long as uh, uh, the participants in the market are going to know who those primary dealers are. And if someone, if an individual has the audacity and the perhaps the arrogance to think that they can submit a false bid in someone else's name and then doctor the paperwork to transfer the securities into their own possession before that probably existing person even knew that a bid was put in on their behalf, um, they could pick one of the people off the list of 40 or 100 uh, as, as well as picking out a name out of the air. The only way you that would, you're going you to catch that very quickly. Oh, I don't believe so because in this case uh, the name that they picked was one of the primary mm -hmm. dealers. 
Uh, so on any list, that name would have been on a narrower list, no matter how narrow you made it. Uh, the problem here was that uh, among the problems was that uh, apparently the people who were involved in this uh, weren't afraid or weren't concerned that there'd be any double checking. Yeah, but and I guess this is, we're making this a little more complicated. I mean, and obviously it's very complicated, but why couldn't you just establish a system where you would immediately check with the people that, that, that that's said what they you were buying, I'm, okay? I'm, so you, if XYZ Corporation or, or fund was buying $2 billion worth of two-year uh, securities, uh, you would mail out to them immediately or fax out within, the, within five minutes and say, confirm your bid. You know, are you really buying today? Yes or no? And then the, end of that discussion. The, the okay. World. I mean, you've you know, no. It, there's no. There's a way to confirm these bids very quickly and determine whether the person that's on the line here is fictitious or not. The, Isn't uh, there? I would think. And why don't we have a system like that in place? Right absolutely now? possible to create. Do we have a system like that in place, Mr. Corgan? You're presiding over the market out there, do we? No, sir, we do not. Pardon me. We do not. That is. We do not. Now, I find that really hard to believe. We're yeah. So we're selling multi-billion dollars worth of, of, of securities to people and we don't bother to send a, you know, a dollar fifty fax to determine if they're... Well, uh, it's not as simple as a dollar fifty fax. <laughs> uh, the kind of feature of automated confirmation that you're speaking of is one of the kinds of things that would be associated with these systems that are in development right now that I spoke of. Now you say, well, why are they in development instead of there. And I guess the answer I would give you that is twofold. There's one, at least up until this unfortunate, if not tragic <coughs> event, the auction system had worked incredibly well over the years, incredibly well. And second, it's a resource question. Uh, a judgment was made, for example, a couple of years ago that we were going to put a very large commitment of technological resources into a basic comprehensive redesign of the Treasury Federal Reserve book entry system. And this book entry system is really the thing that makes this, mar this market work. This is the solid gold Rolls Royce of processing systems throughout the world. Now, maybe in hindsight, we should have said, okay, we've got this resource base to work with. We, ought to, uh, we also just got through with a major commitment of resources to the development of a thing called Treasury Direct, which was essentially a system designed to let small investors, I mean very small investors, have the benefits of the book entry system. Now, maybe again, that was a misjudgment of resources. We should have put that off and put this one further up front. But I think the judgment about the sequence within which these things have been done was one that implicitly uh, accepted the fact that the Treasury auction system up until this event had worked very, very well. I know the chair has been very generous with my time, and I guess I, I would want to make one last 30-second observation, and that is it seems to me it would not be overly complicated for us to ha establish a system, one, where we would qualify before closure buyers. I mean, we do that in real estate. We do it in every other I thing that we buy that. and sell. We should do that and have a list of people that are qualified buyers. The second thing, it seems to me, we ought to have a very simple process of of instantaneously checking buyers to determine if, in fact, this, the, the, the bid being submitted is a legitimate bid or not. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out a couple of those simple little things that, that probably could have prevented the very thing that we're talking about. Had there been an instantaneous check on, on uh, Warburg, uh, you know, we, we probably wouldn't have had this problem or we would have caught it sooner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know, how long are we continuing here, do you know? Um, you have concluded your questions <laughs> for the day. Uh, very generous. <laughs> the, uh, the chair has a few questions. Uh, Mr. Breeden, Chairman Breeden, uh, what are the rules for the sale and distribution of municipal bonds? Well, there's a <clears throat> there are a whole um, series of rules established by the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board as to the sale and distribution of securities rules. There are some 
uh, rules of the Commission that also apply, but MSRB is the basic uh, rulemaking entity. And there's a series of rules uh, for the sale and distribution of corporate bonds as well? Uh, there definitely are rules pertaining, uh, uh, quite extensive rules pertaining to the offering of corporate equities and corporate debt securities of all types. But somehow we have this gigantic loophole in which uh, government, uh, government bonds are, are, are treated significantly different than corporate or municipal or state bonds. Well, one of the things, certainly as to corporate equities and corporate debt, one of the, in the issuance process, we are, of course, uh, applying the prospectus requirements, disclosure and accounting requirements that go to the creditworthiness of the issuer. It has never been presumed necessary to have a prospectus for treasury debt because of the nature of that security and the absence of uh, but, in government, but in the government securities area, buyers and sellers are not protected uh, by federal law from fraud as they would be otherwise. Uh, no, Congressman, that's not correct. The uh, basic anti-fraud provision of the federal securities laws, uh, Section 10B, uh, well, I should say among the basic securities fraud provisions uh, that we have, Section 10B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 makes it unlawful to utilize a scheme to uh, defraud or an artifice of fraud in connection with the purchase or sale of any security, any, any type, sure. municipals, corporate, or government. The, uh, one of the concerns uh, that I have is, uh, uh, is that you're dealing with two markets here, dealing with a primary market the people who buy, I guess, direct, the wholesalers. And then there's the retailers, I guess, is a, probably an inarticulate way, the secondary market. And that's a global market. It trades every day, uh, uh, Mr. Corrigan, uh, pensions, uh, insurance companies, uh, uh, small municipalities, uh, private individuals. And it seems to me that uh, uh, the abuse that Solomon engaged in uh, is, is a, one of a, a thousand points of light that uh, seems to be much broader uh, in the secondary market. And my concern that uh, uh, when you get into that secondary market, you're dealing with a much significantly less sophisticated uh, uh, investor. Mr. Breeden, if I may ask you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, what, what efforts do you think need, if any, to strengthen the regulatory control over the secondary market and government securities that are lacking now? Well, we think that at a minimum three changes would be necessary. First of all, we ought to have the same kind of uh, instantaneous or virtually instantaneous uh, reporting of bids and offers, uh, prices of transactions and volumes of transactions that uh, the entire market has available to it uh, through uh, the consolidated tape system for equities, uh, the NASDAQ system and other uh, reporting systems of that kind so that um, we should not restrict information as to the best prices in the marketplace to a club of a few uh, primary dealers with others being uh, forced to operate, uh, relatively speaking, uh, less well informed. Uh, so that uh, better price reporting, and, and there are certain systems, uh, the GovPIC system that has just gone into operation in June that are improving the information flow in the marketplace, but that is certainly one of the most important uh, reforms. I might add that those prices should be available not only, in my opinion, should be available not only for Treasury securities, but for all agency securities. GovPICS does not now deal with uh, things like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac securities, and I believe that uh, reporting ought to be available for all of these securities. Secondly, I think uh, that the current legislative prohibition that prohibits the NASD from applying to its normal members its normal rules against churning and uh, unauthorized trading and un excessive markups. And these are well understood rules. They apply to 1,500 NASD members if they're selling their customers uh, municipal securities or corporate securities, but they can do anything they want. Uh, okay. if they're selling government securities, government securities, and we ought to end that prohibition. It should be repealed uh, and allow NASD to apply its normal rules. And finally, lest anyone think that we uh, have any willingness to see a repeat of this situation, uh, we ought to make the submission of knowingly false information 
to the United States Treasury or to any government agency in connection with the primary distribution process, auctions or other distributions, the knowing submission of false information ought to be specifically unlawful. Now, I believe it is unlawful as a violation of 10B, but in the same way that we uh, uh, money laundering might have been a violation of normal banking statutes, and but we passed a specific law in the money laundering area to heighten the obligation of management to be aware of that uh, practice and to take certain affirmative steps against it, so too we ought to make it very clear uh, that there is a specific prohibition against this kind of uh, wrongful activity. Now, it may be that there are other changes as to part of the overall regulatory system and the auction process uh, that ought to be made. And I don't want to take a position contrary to some of the suggestions that Chairman Markey has made. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I also share the view uh, that has been expressed here that this is uh, a complex market that uh, regulatory costs uh, have to be borne carefully in mind and that we need but to proceed a lot, there's carefully. a lot at risk in that secondary market and we're not talking about plain old vanilla 30-year treasury bills. We've got uh, strips and reverse repurchase agreements and, 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 and it proliferates limited only by, at this juncture, the imagination of folks to seek uh, uh, unique ways to, to, to raise money. I'm, I'm concerned that we have, in effect, created a black hole that allows folks to, to, to move in and out as, as they see fit. Mr. Paul, do you agree or disagree with what Chairman Breeden suggested? Is um, Treasury would support all of uh, basically in fundamental agreement with the SEC in each of those three areas. We may have some uh, minor differences as to the particulars once you get into those areas, but uh, fundamentally support sales practice rules, uh, broader information dissemination, and clarification that violation of auction rules is a violation of the securities laws. Not that we doubt it, but that we think that clarification will uh, lead to better enforcement. Who should write those rules? <clears throat> well, in the sales practice area, we, we think we ought to follow the model of the Government Securities Act for a couple of reasons. Under the Government Securities Act, the Treasury was the rule maker. And that was the decision Congress made in 1986. We think it was the right one for two reasons. First, Treasury is in a position to assure balance as between bank and non-bank dealers. And secondly, Treasury is the agency charged with um, the very important task of financing the national debt at the lowest possible cost. We have, if anything, the strongest interest in preserving both the integrity of the marketplace and, an efficient and its liquid efficiency market and liquidity. Helps that interest. Efficient liquid markets uh, help that. And in furthermore, well-policed, well-regulated markets uh, tend to be more liquid, so uh, we're not opposing that as well. Mr. Breed, Mr. Mullins, the Senate provision uh, gives the Treasury veto. Uh, I assume that is the uh, uh, the administration position, or the Fed disagrees with that, or the SEC agrees with that. May I ask? Uh, In general, you? we favor consultation and cooperation and oppose the granting of veto uh, powers over other agencies' regulation in this area. So. Uh, I think your presumption would be correct that we would oppose the, the veto power. Mr. Breeden, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, concur with Governor Mullins, and in fact, uh, the SEC, Federal Reserve, and FDIC did uh, uh, write jointly to Chairman Dodd of the Senate Banking Committee uh, with respect to this point and uh, suggested that we thought coordination and cooperation is certainly warranted and would be our preference. Can you point than to a, a system that, uh, that, that structures that coordination and cooperation in a way that, that ends up with an effective regulation? Well, I think there are, there are coordination provisions uh, that require, uh, before rules can be written, uh, consultations with uh, with other agencies uh, throughout the law. There's certainly several provisions in the securities laws that obligate the SEC to consult specifically with uh, other agencies, including the Federal Reserve or the FDIC or the Treasury, before we go forward with rulemakings to make sure that they are aware of specific proposals and, uh, and that we are well informed. I would like to indicate that um, uh, in the sales practice area, it is my judgment that for those rules to be effective, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We have rules against churning. We have rules in the United States against 
trading for people who didn't authorize you to trade it. We have rules against uh, uh, sticking unsuitable securities that are highly esoteric, risky securities into the portfolio of someone who was not capable of absorbing either information as to the risk or bearing the risk of loss. Those things are already against the rules but, of the NASD. But they and, don't uh, We don't need a, a new cannon to fire at that. What we need to do is to say that the existing rules that work very well in that area ought to be applied. Because they do not apply today to government security. Correct. And Congress ought to repeal uh, the prohibition against those rules applying to government securities. That would mean that the normal process would occur. Those rules would be applied by the self-regulatory organization, by the NASD. It's the NASD that writes those rules. Uh, they are, in fact, reviewed by the SEC to make sure they're consistent with uh, the public policy objectives set forth in the Securities Acts. And we'd be very happy to consult uh, in detail with the Treasury about uh, the review of those rules. But that's the way the system ought to work. Governor Mullins, you uh, grabbed the microphone, yeah, so I assume that I means you want to use I would just it. point out that we already have sales practice authority for the New York Stock Exchange. And of course, the bank regulators can apply. So we do have just this one gap, and it, it would seem easier as well as most responsive to the problems in this area if we would simply close that gap rather than trying to invent an entire new mechanism of, of rules. I should point out that even in the Government Securities Act, uh, uh, Treasury is the primary regulator, but the Fed and the SEC are required to consult with them. Uh, uh, and I, I wouldn't understand the need for a veto uh, uh, power over independent agencies' uh, uh, authorities. Mr. Breeden, uh, Mr. Mullen, Governor Mullins, Chairman Breeden, apologize for not using your titles correctly. Uh, um, is the Treasury a reluctant regulator here? Are they too cozy with the primary folks who got to buy the paper that they're peddling uh, and need to uh, need to sell on a regular basis at the most advantageous? Or don't worry, Mr. Paul, you get a chance to answer. Uh, are they? Uh, is they're issuing the paper? They're negotiating with the folks, as we discovered. They're sitting privately with them the days before, working on information as to what the market's going to look like. Can we expect them to do the kind of job we need? Do we not need a more arm's length, the uh, comptroller, Fed Reserve, SEC uh, uh, approach than to have the Treasury do, uh, try to regulate the very folks that have got to buy the, the paper that they're peddling? Mr. Governor Mullins, you want to yeah. weigh in there? I don't believe that there's a problem with their being too close uh, uh, to the market. I think uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, for example, has the operating relationship, day-to-day -day market relationship, and that is an oper operating and business relationship. And perhaps it would be awkward if the Federal Reserve Bank of New York were the regulator. However, I think uh, uh, from Treasury's perspective, they have the, the distance necessary and I think there's also adequate uh, authority, especially enforcement authority, uh, perhaps with the changes suggested by Chairman Breeden, uh, for the SEC and the Justice Department to be involved as well. I have a quote from one primary broker dealer who says, quote, hey, we're doing you, the Treasury, a favor. Get out of the way. That's not exactly the attitude of one I guess I would expect of a uh, of, of, of an effective regulator if the folks think they're doing you a big old favor. Mr. Powell? Well, they're not doing us any favor, and uh, uh, no primary dealer has ever uh, assumed that kind of an attitude uh, with any Treasury official that I'm aware of. And uh, there, there isn't a lot of coziness going on here. I think if you look back at the summer of 1990, you'll see that there was, in fact, a fairly confrontational uh, relationship with Solomon Brothers in particular over the 35 percent rule. Mr. Moser was quoted uh, extensively criticizing Treasury. Um, I, I think we have the distance we need to carry out the job we need to do. Mr. Breeden, Chairman Breeden, did you want to be heard on this point? And then I will yield to my friend from Kansas. I would uh, <clears throat> uh, concur generally in the uh, comments of Governor Mullins, uh, and uh, I think as respects the Treasury auction process, um, while it is important that we respond and respond vigorously to what went wrong in this case, it is also important to recognize what has gone right in the past. Uh, we have a process for distributing, unfortunately, 
uh, literally trillions of dollars of debt securities of the United States. I think any system that separated the issuer of those securities from the auction process and that removed from the Treasury the control and direction of the auction process itself would be uh, likely to do severe damage uh, to the process for issuing those securities. So I, I think there's a benefit for the Treasury having a close and uh, intimate knowledge of the market uh, for its securities so it can hopefully, as a taxpayer, so it can get us all the best possible price and, and hold down the cost of, of running the government. I would distinguish sharply the auction process, the process of making those distributions from regulation of the aftermarket. There, uh, if, uh, if a boiler room operator wants to uh, uh, stick uh, a, a widow and orphan with uh, strips of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac securities or zero coupon treasuries uh, and, and uh, conduct uh, um, high pressure sales tactics in an improper way, uh, the response and the oversight of that practice, whether they whether the broker happens to be peddling um, state of Ohio bonds or AT&T bonds or Treasury bonds shouldn't matter. There we have certain standards for how people in the market treat their customers and there shouldn't be any uh, exception for these high quality securities for the application that, that, of the normal, normal sales rule. That's precisely my point, Chairman Breeden. The, the, the daily trading volume in this aftermarket exceeds exceeds by a significant amount the volume uh, on, on the U.S. stock exchange, which is limited and regulated in ways uh, most folks probably would say uh, in, in too broad a way. But putting that aside, we are talking with, with, with a, a, a market that's bigger than what you currently have significant regulatory effort directed at, for which millions of Americans think because there is the adjectival description government security in front of it in some way is better and is protected. And the reality is, is that pension insurance and individuals do not have in this secondary market treatment the kind of, the kind of appropriate protections that, that I think are, are, are essential. Mr. Eckert, I, I want to concur with the fact, uh, as, as Governor Mullins indicated, there is a gap in current law and I think we ought to fix that gap. I would not want people listening to these proceedings or reading of them to walk away with the perception that this market has experienced significant levels of customer fraud because of the absence of those rules. I'm, while there have been certain cases uh, that we're aware of of that happening, uh, I think on the whole, uh, this has been a very uh, safe market for individuals and institutions to purchase Treasury securities, and I would not want to see created any suggestion that people should not feel comfortable Mr. in buying Chairman, your, your admonishment is correct. My questions are focusing on that gap, which is nonetheless a significant gap that I think we, we are remiss in, in, not, in not, not addressing. Uh, one of the concerns I had, I heard all of the gentlemen uh, uh, make mention of it in, in, in my uh, listening, is that, you know, how long is it before we're going to know uh, exactly what happened and, and, and how we fixed it and, and whether or not we should defer consideration or just a plain extension of the sunset provisions of this, which fail us this October, uh, to give the Treasury uh, existing authorities and. Um, six, eight months, my colleague from New Jersey pointed out to all of us that we never seem to do things in a very timely way. Anyway, um, I think a couple of things have intervened, and this is my objective assessment. Uh, one is Solomon Brothers, and the second one is BCCI, an untidy mess if there is one. And I'm not sure that uh, uh, when, when, they can re when they convene across the hall here and start unraveling some of that mess uh, under the threat of oath, uh, that uh, we should not lose sight of that. I am linking the two for only this single purpose. The administration has advanced to us a proposal for significant change in a nation's banking laws. I, and, and this is my own opinion, am not sure that we should advance beyond uh, uh, re re uh, recapitalizing the, the bank insurance fund until we understand the full implications of both of these. Uh, to allow banks or non-banks to, to move into areas of, of which there is still some lack of confidence until the safeguards are built in to protect this gap, 
until I am certain that I have at least a better sense of, of the ability of, of each of you to play together effectively as a team, I think it would be folly for the Congress uh, 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 to go forward. We've got a, two train wrecks here. And until the track is cleared, I think it would be a mistake to, uh, uh, to go forward. Uh, and I intend to press that with, uh, with my House leadership. Um, unless my colleague from Kansas has a comment. Uh, well, the only uh, observation I would make as we wrap up here today is that, that um, and I, I know that uh, Mr. Powell has heard me express these reservations before and probably isn't particularly wild about hearing them again, but uh, um, I've had grave concern about whether our regulatory agencies are really capable of regulating all the things that we think they should be regulating. And I must say, today, I didn't hear anything that increased my confidence in, in our capacity to really monitor all the things that we're expecting to be monitored. So that's one observation I would make. And the other thing that I would just observe is that, that uh, I am also concerned about this close relationship between the Treasury and, and the uh, uh, industry that you're doing business with. And I understand that there has to be uh, some communication, and, and that communication is vital, as Mr. Breeden and others have suggested. But I question whether uh, it has gotten a little bit too close. This advisory committee, I'm inclined to agree with Mr. Corrigan, has a very questionable value in light of our current situation. So uh, I thank you all for coming today. Your testimony has been helpful. And let, one last question I would have, and that is, who, who, by the way, is coordinating a response to this problem on the part of the administration for the president? Is there anybody that's Treasury trying Department. to, pardon me? Is, the Treasury Department. So, the, so Secretary Brady is responsible for working with the Fed and working with the SEC to come up with a comprehensive administration response. Now, when will that be available? Well, uh, as I said in our testimony, uh, we would expect within 90 days to come back to Congress okay. with recommendations. Okay, thank you. So can we delay consideration of the banking bill till we hear from the Secretary of the Treasury on uh, his recommendations to resolve this matter? That's between you and the leadership. <laughs> there being no further business coming before the committee at this time, the committee stands adjourned. Subject to the call of the chair. For more information on these proceedings, you can write to the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittees on Telecommunications and Finance at 316 House Annex No. 2, Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. A programming note to be with us tonight when we open our telephone lines for a live viewer call-in program with Michael Barone, co-author of The Almanac of American Politics and Phil Duncan, editor of Politics in America, 1992, the 102nd Congress. Both books are guides to the Congress, and the authors will talk with us about how they gather and update their information and just who uses it. That's live tonight, beginning at 6.30 Eastern Time, 3.30 p.m. on the West Coast. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable television companies. This week, several conservative organizations launched media campaigns aimed at rallying support for Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. Judge Thomas will testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee next week as part of a confirmation process that will decide whether or not he will become the newest associate justice to sit on the nation's highest court. On Tuesday, the Conservative Victory Committee, in association with the group Citizens United, began airing a television ad in the Washington, D.C. area. The spot, entitled, Who Will Judge the Judge?, questions the ethics of Democratic Senators Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts, Alan Cranston of California, and Joseph Biden of Delaware. Senators Kennedy and Biden sit on the Senate panel.